Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Human Happy Hour. Today, we are joined by Rusty Dewey's. Rusty is an actor, writer, and comedian, best known for uh, in New England for his one-man comedy show featuring his original character, The Logger. He has also appeared in several films and various TV shows, including Law and Order, Saturday Night Live, and The Cosby Mysteries. So Rusty's got had a pretty sizable bio, so we had to kind of whittle it down a bit, but excited to have you here with us and lots to talk about. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming, man. It's it was uh it was I was so excited when you said yeah. <laughs> you didn't you didn't know that it was gonna be a lot of me forgetting the date and then figuring out Zoom, but we're here. It just reminded me of me, really. I was like, oh, he's like me. <laughs> that was great. I, so I was tell me, is that an actor thing? I don't know. <laughs> it might be a Vermont thing. <laughs> I, I kind of, I take, I take July off basically about three or four shows. And uh, I checked out, I just came back from my sister. I, I, I checked out kind of, you know, with not being uh, precise with doubling up when I'm doing things. And so that's, that's not an excuse. That's the truth. Oh, okay. That's cool. I, you have a motorcycle in your house. That's a, yeah, that's a dirt bike, Yamaha 450 YR. Yep. Just, wow. <laughs> I like my background. I've got a drum, <laughs> but jeez. Well, I, wow. I got a, I got a John Deere tractor over there. Oh too, my God. I mean. <laughs> Where are, is that a garage? Is that inside the house? Like, well, Rena, it's a, it's a barn. It's a really big oh, uh, post and beam barn there. Look at, you can kind of see it's away from. Wow. From the house and it's, uh, where nice. I store my videos and stuff and tools, but also uh, I do um, events here. The, you guys can see the stage in the corner. Ah. I have people over and I interview them. It's it's alive what you're doing. Yeah. Oh, nice. Like, yeah. Yeah. People, people, Rick Cabot, the head of Darn Tough. I just had last week the our, our Vermont's number one game warden, uh, Jason Batchelder. Just I invite 50 people. Uh, you know, it's educational. It's just kind of a fun way of getting together. Oh, nice. Wow. That's now cool. that you, now that I see the stage, it reminds me of when I used to go to like punk rock shows in barns. <laughs> like, that's cool. As a teenager. Well, you oh know, God. Reed and J Jason, uh, and Reno will be hip to this too. I, I kind of thought about it like that. Um, who was the drummer for the band? Died recently. Really cool oh. guy. He would go ahead. I'm trying, I'm thinking, oh, uh, Levon Helm. Oh yeah. Yeah. Levon Helm had a bar barn in upstate New York and they used to practice there and then people started showing up and then they started doing these barn barn events kind of thought of it that way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's good to have a space like that, especially in a community like, like, you know, we have. <laughs> yeah. 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 We're both from Vermont in case anybody's wondering <laughs> or live in Vermont. Right. Yeah. Wow. Cool. So, uh, so what, what were you doing today? Anything ex interesting? Not a lot. I mean, as I said, July is kind of is, is off, basically. I, I do the ride, the exercise class. It's a toned down soul cycle. In the morning I did that. I did my morning errands, came back, did some administrative things. And then I went downtown and uh, paid some bills, went to the dump, came back, watered the garden, ate come out here. I'm out here most every night, except for about two months in the winter. I do have a wood stove over there, but those really cold winter months. And this is where I read and, and think, look out the two barn doors and, and, and write stuff and, or not, or just sit around and have, have friends over. That's what I did today. It's a very, very easy day. Yeah. You know, when I was looking up keywords for you, beer came up as one of the, <laughs> one of the <laughs> Be beard or Be beer, beer, like no, beer. Which is funny because this is, this, is, this is an interview and I don't drink other than a just a sip of scotch. Oh, every once lager. Even... Lager. That's why. Oh, lager. Yeah. I, it just hit me. Yeah. 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 There you go. Oh, my God. Well, it's a good thing your act is called IPA. Right, right. Although, you know, Al the Alchemist is a sponsor of mine. It's a, it's a oh, really? Oh, yeah, um, yeah. My, I, think, I think my friend used to own that. 
with the the one in um, Waterbury. Yeah, Jen Kimmich and John Kimmich. K I M M I C H. He must have sold it then. They they sold it and then they just went into the beer, the Alchemist, and the Heady Topper, the Focal Banger, and all that stuff. Ah, Heady Topper, yes, I know. Yeah, yeah. Topper. Cool. So I thought you were from Vermont. I had in this research, I was like from Philadelphia. Yeah. I had no idea. Wow, my Nana will be so happy about that. She's from Philadelphia. <laughs> yeah, I moved up here. Parents moved up when I was seven. And and when I first did that first logger show, which is a theater show all around Vermont, I did say that. I, I always made a point. I didn't want to go out there and, because I was playing a Vermont character, obviously. Oh, I'm looking at the camera. Yeah. A Vermont character. And uh, I made sure to say that I, I was a, a native Vermonter. And that definition, of course, of being a Vermonter, you're a Vermonter. I don't know if you're we're born here or not, but it doesn't really matter uh, to some people. And to some people it does, you know, yeah, you could be a seventh generation Vermonter and uh, look down on a second generation Vermonter. So it's all subjective. Yeah. We're, a, we're, a, we're an elite group here. <laughs> I am from really? Vermont originally. <laughs> yeah. Elite and proud. What town, what town were you? Would Colchester. You so you were a Laker, Colchester Laker. Yep. That's right. Cool. Did I just go? Yep. I did. <laughs> yeah. <you're good. laughs> So now, Jason, how many generations were? I'm learning things because I don't know anything about Me? Vermont. Uh, my generation, no, my dad was from Brooklyn and my mom, her whole side of the family was Lebanese. So I, I guess that'd be me. <laughs> I'd be first. Well, your your da daughter, you just showed me a picture um, and I didn't respond to that because I was trying to get on. But oh. anyway, she's she's a Vermonter. Believe, right? it or, believe it or not, that that is Luke and the boy and he is beautiful. Everybody oh, does. Yeah, everybody does quick. that. Uh, no, I looked real quick. I no, no, was... you didn't. Trust me. He is beautiful. He, he's like, he could be uh, he, totally, totally beautiful. Yeah. He's... Not a bad thing to be. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, everyone it happens in grocery stores all the time. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God, you're a little girl. I'm just like, yeah. <laughs> Luke. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Cool. So let's see here. You, um, so where in Philadelphia? Cause, um, I've heard a lot from my Nana about Philadelphia. She lived in the row houses. <laughs> um, yeah. oh my God. So I, I, if you said something about Philadelphia, I'd probably, I'd probably recognize what you're talking about. I've heard a lot. Right. Well, my, my mom's side was a row house. My dad's side, my dad was 50 when I was born. I sit here 61 years old. So he was born in 1911. So he actually grew up on a farm in, Phil in Philadelphia. But yeah, you would recognize Tasty Cakes, Hoagie. Instead of Submarine, it's it's called a Hoagie. Oh, yeah. Things like the Chestnut Hill is where I was born. Chestnut Hill. I really don't know much about it. How do you say the thing that warms your your living room in the corner that has the like bar? I'm not going to say the word. So it's got the bars and it heats. What's that called? A heat? heat? I don't know. A it radiates oh, uh, heat. Oh, radiator, radiator. Phil, Philly people. I don't have a Philly accent. Philly people have a really difficult accent to pin, but when you hear it, you know it. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They uh, they almost sound a little bit um, snotty, but they're just it's just their accent for some reason. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. They, yeah. they have similar things they say all the time. Yeah. I would say, I'd say, Nana, why do you call it a radiator? And she goes, it's radiator. I'm like, but it radiates heat. <laughs> rad, <laughs> it's rad, man. It's a radiator. Yep. And, um, and, and in a corner, if something's directly across the corner, <laughs> but you right. know, you don't get the Philadelphia yeah, caddy corner, kitty corner. Caddy, caddy, kitty corner. Yeah. <laughs> those are cool. Those are, those are all cool things. You know, those are all, Oh yeah, thing. and you know, in Vermont different. we have creamies, which creamies. Yeah. yeah, in California I don't. She's from LA, so what? Cal, what are they? It's ice cream. Well, I'm from Baltimore. You're from originally, Baltimore, right. and I right. like to hope that I didn't retain any of those accents because. <laughs> yeah, that's a, well, that's close to Philadelphia, relatively speaking. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So you're in the know. Yeah, <laughs> I've been to Philadelphia a couple times for like conferences and things but oh, okay so in philadelphia you were in theater that's where you started in theater or no, no i mean no we moved here i was in second grade yeah uh, so how so take me from philadelphia to to college like how did you what okay, happened? To philadelphia, then stowe vermont and then third you know third grade up in high school plays i did you guys and uh, musicals 
I played basketball. I was a drummer. I'm a drummer in um, high school plays. That's what I concentrated on. I wasn't a good student. Then when I got out of college, uh, high school, I didn't want to go to college. I was out of college, high school, excuse me, for four years. And Champlain College then had sports, as you know. And uh, the college coach, Bob Tipson, saw me playing, and he offered me a scholarship. That was a two-year school. So I moved in from Stowe to Burlington, which in 1982 was kind of a big deal for a Stowe kid. I was in the big city. I went there for two years. I was recruited to go on to Castleton State. This is my claim to fame. The coach there recruited me to go to Castleton State. Long story short, that coach was his name Stan Van Gundy, and he's the head of operations at the Detroit Pistons right now, and he's coached Shaq and everything. So my claim to fame is I was recruited by an NBA coach, and I turned him down. So I didn't go, but here I was in Burlington after the two years of college, <clears throat> and I wanted to stay there, and I, I did a show at the Flynn Theater cabaret because i wanted to do a show on that stage i was 24 and i met someone whose boyfriend was doing a show at vermont repertory theater which was a guy named robert ringer he started this small theater and again now jason that's back in 85 in burlington not much going on so if there was a good theater group there it it was kind of out there and people people saw it and um i, I did a play called judavine which was about vermont written by a poet named David Budbill from Wolcott. And it was uh, like our town, but Vermont. And I played three different Vermont characters. I stayed on with Vermont Rep and did like Sam Shepard stuff. Now I'm doing serious stuff at Vermont Repertory Theater in my mid twenties, pumping gas at Bourne's Texaco on the Shelburne Road. I fell in love with that. Uh, unlikely because I'm a truck driving kind of a guy in high school did concrete work and, and logged after high school in between college. So then I fell in love with that stuff. And at 29, this is the short story, 29, I moved to New York City. Wow. Oh, yeah. What was it like going from, because it sounds like things are pretty small town. <laughs> and what was that transition like going from being there to New well, York City? Well, good question. I, I moved to New York City to be an actor because I was curious not because I was reading Shakespeare and studying, you know, the Meisner method. It's because I was curious, how does a Stowe kid that went to movies all his life get up on that screen? Who likes theater? How do you, how do you get up? How do you get on that screen? So I moved to New York. I quickly got a job at William Doyle Galleries, which was a, which is an auction house on the Upper East Side. And I, this is crazy. I got a job as William Doyle's assistant, his right-hand man. I was his driver. I was his confidant. He had a wife and three daughters. I took them out of their little fancy schools and uh, did that for six years. That, so that was an education. So I was, I moved to New York City. The, the immenseness of the city is one thing, but I was really comf I had a comforting situation, the right hand man of this, of this family and a very facile education of art and uh, money and William Doyle was at that time 47, and he'd started this auction house by himself. And I'm sitting next to him for six years, learning the ins and outs of business. And it wasn't like I was the driver with the hat. I was, I was part of the family. So, that's, so I learned all about the, the business at William Doyle Gallery. I loved New York City. I lived there 11 years. And uh, Bill Doyle then dies after six years. I'm still working at the gallery. Kathy, his wife, takes over and says, you can do anything you want here. We'll teach you to do it. I'm ex expert to be an expert in American or Bella Park. I said, I, no, I want to kick in the acting now. I've been in New York City for six years. I kind of know it. And Jay Craven put me in a movie. He's a Vermont filmmaker. And I got my picture in the New York Times with Rip Torn. This was when independent movies were a new thing. So the New York Times came to this little Vermont town to cover it. And I got calls from, a, I sent out a hundred of those pictures and uh, my resume. And I got calls from 10 agents. And I started doing commercials. I, wow. I have, a, I have a look. That's So that's all true. That's the short way of telling it. But um, I started doing commercials. I worked at the gallery five more years, did a ton of work in New York, a bunch of movies and uh, TV and uh, commercials. I did 30 national commercials. Learned to be on in front, in front of the lens. I didn't sit in a trailer. I would always watch what was going on. The last couple of years in... In, in New York, I started driving home every weekend, which is six hours, because my dad was then, if I'm 35, he's 85. 
he was healthy. My mom's 20 years younger, so things were good. But I felt the pull to come back, and I wrote in the car, back and forth, six hours each time. I wrote the first logger stories while I was driving. And then I did them at a talent show, and I thought, people like this. Uh, I wonder if city people would like it, meaning Burlington. So I called up Jimmy Swift at first night. And I and I he, he allowed me in. My my show is rated SC, some cussing in first nights, a family New Year's Eve celebration. But he said, Well, let we'll put a disclaimer out front. And I did five shows at first night and people loved it. And then I just said, I'm just I'm gonna do a tour of this. And I set up a tour and kind of went crazy. I mean, kind of went crazy. And then after a year and a half of doing that, I thought, I'll make a video. And my friend said, That won't work because you're on stage, you're a theater guy. And I said, well, and so I'd go back to New York, still living in New York. I'd go back and I'd rent the video of Robin Williams and Richard Pryor. And I said, well, they're, they're still funny when they're one inch tall. So I uh, hired a crew and I booked Virgin's Opera House for two nights. And I always produced myself. If I'm at the Virgin's Opera House, now it's a little different, but I would always rent the place because you do a lot better. If I rent the place for, let's say at that time, two nights, it cost 800 bucks. Put ads in the papers. There were newspapers then. If you put an ad, if you put $4,000 worth of ads in the Burlington Free Press then, everybody saw it. So that I would fill the place two nights, that's 400 people at that time, 15 bucks, that's, that would be 10, that's like, isn't that six grand? You know, and your expenses are 1,200. But if they would present me, they'd say, we'll give you $2,500. So I always produce myself. I produced myself two nights at the Virgin's Opera House. Two nights we shot it with three cameras. We edited it. I got a thousand of them in August, 1998. And I said, I'm gonna sell these thousand videos if I have to go door to door. And uh, there were 160 independent bookstores in Vermont then. So I went around to all those. And at that point I'd been doing movies. So they kind of knew who I was. They kind of heard about me from first night and these bookstores took them. And then I called VP of Vermont Public TV and they put me on, they put my video on as a pledge. And it was a snowy night in December and everybody in Vermont was in their house, you know, four, four stations back then watching. And all of a sudden they'd click on Vermont Public Television and there's this guy standing on the black stage doing Vermont stuff. And it went nuts. So by, by that December, I produced it, I wrote it, I distributed the videos, I paid for it all with my money. I'd sold 12,000 of those videos. Wow. At 15 wow. bucks I was getting for each of them. That's fantastic. So that's how that whole thing started. Boom, 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 boom. I've been doing it ever since 26 years ago. Wow. That's I'm, great. They, what's striking to me, I think, is what you had to do then to promote yourself and get it, like, versus, like, like, if you started now, right, you probably would just, do something on YouTube, maybe? Or, or do you feel like it would be easier or harder if you had to start now? You know, Bill Gates was born at the right time for what he knew how to do, technically and also as far as building that business, Steve Jobs. What if Steve Jobs was now 31 years old? The timing for what he was prepared to do wouldn't have been right. So. The timing was right for me because I'm, I'm a disciplined, hard worker. And Jason knows there's Irina. It's Rena, right? Yes. <laughs> there's 600,000 people in this state. So you can literally, if you want, touch every one of them. So you go from town, this town and you put up your posters and 300 people come. And then, and then the next weekend you're at a town 25 miles away where lives all the relatives of the people who just saw you this weekend and they tell all the relatives and it accumulates. So I did it right. That's the old fashioned way. The question was, would I be able to do it now? No, I'm, I'm not. A, if I was 30, maybe I would, but I don't do it. I don't, I don't do taped performances anymore because I don't want to learn how to put it on whatever you would put it on now. I'm, you know, I'm kind of at the, you know, done my thing so now i wouldn't be interested in doing it this way it was really footwork live theater and then the video and i'm telling you i've sold a hundred thousand of those things I, i've done three videos and cds and i did calendars 
back when people bought calendars, I said, how do I also, you know, market myself differently onto a calendar? And in one of the months I was naked, except for covered a little bit. It was funny, you know, a little, couple of elves holding the Christmas tree in front of me, you know, that's all I had on. <laughs> and those, I sold 10,000 of those things the first year and then 9,000 the second wow. year. People, people, it was a different time and I was the right person for that time. I tried to find the calendar online because I was I wanted to show Rena. Yeah, I was gonna say, does somebody have the calendar? <laughs> I did. I did seven. I did seven calendars. Yeah. Wow. And, and each 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 you know each month I thought of the shot. And I hired a kid that went to school with me. Guy who went to school with me, and it was a lot of work. But uh, there was borders. There was there were Barnes. There was Barnes and Noble. I would go to the fairs and have my booth at the fair. I would do, and then, and then people started calling me to do their banquets, to do their Christmas parties. So there were the live shows I would do. There were the videos. There were the holiday parties. There were the summer parties. There were the, and then the schools learned about me. And then I let it out that I was a, not the person that was on stage. I'm a, pretty much a really straight shooter. And I let that out. And then the schools got a hold of it. And they said, we want you to come in and talk to the kids in school who aren't really into school and uh you know so so that's a part of it so it was a really big business i did uh somebody called me to do columns in new york and i would i was in six papers over there and then i did so many of them i collected those in two books and then i sold thousands and thousands of those books no distributor no manager no anybody that's amazing. It's unbelievable really yeah. yeah wow how do you how did you teach yourself that um how to do that. I mean, I've like right now I would go online and look up how to do it, but how did you teach yourself how to do it? Good question. I didn't know how to put ads in papers, yellow pages. Yeah. <laughs> Rattleboro. What's the paper? Call them up. Can I, can I place an ad? And I put my posters up where I learned to do all of it. If you remember Bill Doyle, William Doyle, he, it was William Doyle galleries. He was William Doyle. When we'd go to a estate and meet the lawyer and the kids of the person that had died, they'd go, you're actually William Doyle. You know, he always made his callbacks. He said, Rust he was from Boston. Rustola, it's not yesterday, it's tomorrow. I always make your callbacks, treat everyone well. That's where I learned to do that business that, that way. And yeah, but it was, it was the yellow pages and uh, yeah, faxing the poster things back and forth. But that's all you knew. So it didn't seem like it was a bunch of work. Oh yeah, I remember when I was my first band. I remember walking around Burlington, putting them on, putting posters on boards and poles, whatever you could do, you know. And and I mean that's what you did. Seven days paper stuff like that. Our our local free paper. Um, yeah, yeah. You ha I mean, yeah, it was all legwork. <laughs> now you just post it to your friends from high school. <laughs> well, now, now you just post it. Yeah, but but. 17 other bands posted. Yeah. And, you know, when I started, Rena, literally, I'd put my poster up at a poster board at a small store, country store, right? And it was my poster, and I, I went big, and it was always this mug, 17 by 11. And it was my poster, the, the lost cat, and the guy selling the wood. Now, there are theater groups and magicians and every little town has farmers markets and festivals all the time. So really, I had any, uh, first of all, what I did was unique. You one guy standing up there talking about from up, there's no competition. <laughs> oh, I don't yeah. mean competition in somebody's better than someone else. Right. I mean competition in what we're going to do tonight. Well, we could do this, 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 this. When I was doing it, it was like, let's go see that guy for the fourth time. Wow. Because you were the only guy that was doing a thing. Is that was that wow? Yeah, but that I'm was before all over the state. That was before the stand up stuff in Burlington. So like there was no like stand up place. Yeah. Way before. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, way before. Yeah. So, I, so it's a multifaceted business, you know, and I I learned the business from Bill, Bill, Bill Doyle. I said, I'm going to go for, you know, I, I, you guys, what do you do, Rena, for work? So I'm a freelance writer and editor. Right. So, and Jason, I know a musician and a writer. So I always thought as a young person, when I did the plays as a young kid, we work so hard on these plays and you rehearse, maybe it's summer theater, you know, rehearse all, and then you do it three times. 
I always thought you're putting so much work into it, man. The work really is getting it out there. And then if you start getting paid for it, well, it's even like, well, hey, Rusty, would you like to do columns? Well, I don't really know how to write. Well, just write what you want and kind of like your stories. And like, can I do it about anything? Yeah. Okay. I didn't go, no, nah, I don't really know how to do that. You know, I took everything. I did everything I could. Wow. Boy so Scouts would call me in Rutland. They'd say, hey, we'd like you to come down, talk to our, but we're having the Eagle Scout, you know, presentation of two Eagle Scouts. It's on a February 3rd. It's a Tuesday. Would you come down, talk to us? There'll be 50 of us there. I'd be like, yes. You know, I wasn't like, no, I'm not going to drive three hours in a potential snowstorm to talk to 50 people. I was like, you're damn right for no money. You know what I mean? Not, not everybody paid. So I just did everything. <laughs> yeah th that's the way it kind of was i mean i when i was in the band same thing you, you you'd play nectars for like on a wednesday night for like nobody and make 30 bucks <laughs> like uh, right much. but wouldn't you wouldn't you maybe get a wedding gig out of that well our band didn't like doing weddings but we got offered a lot but yeah, yeah see yeah. it's just like what you just said i we just we actually didn't do things we didn't like to do but we we're probably not as hard of workers <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just one guy. I didn't. I didn't have any overhead. I didn't. I, that's or I a good still point. just one. Yeah, that, so that's that's basically the the whole thing about the log. That's how the logger's gone. It still still goes. You know. Now, still. how did you get involved with um with David Giancola? Is just through your agent, or did you know him through? He's a, a David Giancola is a filmmaker in Vermont. He started at like nineteen. I think he got a small loan from someone, and then just made a bunch of movies. <laughs> that with like Hollywood people and stuff. They were like B movies, Rena, and his loan was from his father. G Mr. Giancola owns a lot of real estate. Rotten. Well, when I was starting out in, in my early 30s, mid 30s, when I was still in New York, I would come home in the summers. Bill would let me come home in the summers. In the summers, New York shuts down. You know? And I would do summer stuff. And David was doing these movies. Well, all the theater people, my peers, when David Giancola was doing shoot, shoot 'em up movies, schlocky b movies and i was like oh, i'm in new york this guy's cool he's paying i was a screen actress guild actor yeah i'll do it david a couple of weeks on the film I, I did a 50 foot fall i learned to do a, a gun gun work on on david movies i worked with billy ray cyrus and uh, people like that but uh, i learned from him and he just caught he knew i was doing so he knew i was out there he knew i did the jet craven things it was David Giancola making movies up here, Jay Craven, and a woman named Nora Jacobson. I was in two of her movies. I just went for it all. You know, wow. Did I you... would drive two days just to do an audition that's a minute long and wow. then drive to New York. And uh, I mean, Jay Craven put me in his second movie. It was A Stranger in the Kingdom. I worked with Martin Sheen, Ernie Hudson, people like that. And that was a really good movie. And it was so, uh, you know, and then it all transferred down to New York. And, yeah. Yeah, we were in Radical Jack together. You you did Radical Jack? Yeah, I was, uh, yeah, I I had the I had the ponytail then. <laughs> you must have been really young. Uh, yeah, it was in two thousand six or five or four or seven somewhere in there. Were you were you on were you the part of the bad guy group that was? I was I the guy. I was the bodyguard that stands outside the uh, the yeah. plane, and then I go in there. I'm the first guy that gets shot in the warehouse. Yeah, yeah, I remember where I blew up in the Yeah, you, That's you caught a grenade. <laughs> Wait, so right. you two were in the same movie, but you don't remember. Yeah, man. Like you don't remember. I remember him, <laughs> but I was yeah, just a I kid. Mean, like basically. I remember you now. No, I remember you. You were you dressed in black, like. Oh yeah, well, I always yeah. dressed in black, but yes, um, yeah, I got squibs and everything. Um, it was cool because it's the yeah. first time and last time I've ever been squibbed, where the bullets. And they don't have a big budget, so they'd be like, okay, you sure you got this? I'm like, yeah. They're like, okay, because we only have one T-shirt. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And so at action, I just went like this, and it worked somehow. <laughs> yeah. It was scary. But me, dur during that, I was in New York doing stuff, so that was a very integral part of my uh, uh, education and how to do that stuff. Oh, yeah. It was fun to be on those set the set because – he was kind of new also so you could watch the learning process and he and david took to it so quickly and so he was yeah. so, he's so good at at organizing a set 
a, 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 a shoot. Oh my God. Um, were you in any of the, uh, were you in like me, myself and Irene and what lies beneath were both came to Vermont. Did you do anything on those? No, I didn't. I mean, no, I was in New York doing stuff and I, I kind of missed auditions or whatever. And, uh, but no, I, I wasn't. Yeah. Who were you? I, I did. Yeah. I, I, I was crew, but, <laughs> but it was yeah. great. I mean, great pay on those, on those sets. I got yeah. to, uh, I almost, um, I almost uh, hit Harrison Ford with a um, fly swatter by accident. Did you? Yeah. I was a fly wrangler on What Lies Beneath. So. <laughs> hey, man, it's all it's all important. And, you know, I worked on a movie that Harrison Ford was in called The Devil's Own. Brad Pitt was in it. Mm. And I was a stuntman on that movie, hired in two weeks in Brooklyn night shoots. And I got to work with Brad Pitt. But, Rena, you probably know this too, that was a huge thing for me because the cinematographer was Gordon Willis, who was the cinematographer on The Godfather 1, The Godfather 2, oh, wow. Manhattan, what is that? I worked with Gordon Willis, man. You know, it's just, these are things that aren't uh, bra braggadocio. They're, they're just things that I, I can say to myself, that's pretty cool, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, But definitely. I didn't meet Harrison Ford. I didn't work the days that he worked. Ah, yeah, he's, he's pretty cool. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. That is really cool. Now, when you were in New York, I didn't know this either. You you were on Saturday Night Live. When yeah. you're in New York, I don't know if it's like this in L.A. Rena or everything. When when I went to New York, excuse me, people said, people said they said don't do extra work. Well, why not? Because then you'll you'll get kind of stuck in that extra work situation, and people just get stuck there, and that's all they do. So okay, I won't do extra work. And I was getting enough commercials and a little TV spot. So then my agent called and said, Saturday Night Live is looking for a country looking guy. There's two feuding families. This is a great little story. There's two feuding families uh, in the woods trying to get the same water. And they want some extras. And so I said to my agent, nah, I don't want to do extra work. I hung up the phone, called back. I said, this is Saturday Night Live. You might meet someone on that set. You might get to then do it, in, be on inside sometime. That'd be a great experience. So I called up. And they said, yeah, we want you. So I showed up and uh, all those fake commercials in the early years of Saturday Night Live were shot, directed by a guy named Jig Jim Signorelli, very famous guy. And so now I'm on the set with Jim Signorelli and they call all the extras out. They say, come out here in the parking lot. We want to line you up and set you where we want to set you and have you play the parts we want you to play, even though the background. So Will Farrell was the head of one of the families and he was new then. And uh, Chris Farley was there. So I see Will Ferrell. You know, again, he wasn't Will Ferrell. But I knew he was on that show. So I stood near him. And I'm Will Ferrell and I are the same height. And Signorelli was looking at people go, yeah, you, you, you wear this. You're going to stand over there by the law. And he said, you. He pointed at me. He said, you shadow, you shadow Will. You're his right-hand man in this commercial spot that we're filming. So uh, that means that I'm going to be in a two shot with a lead. That's more money. That takes you from an extra to a, 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 a co-star. So I called the agent up, pay phone, said, Hey man, I think they got me. You know, so then they want to talk to the producer. So I got more money, but that thing ran and ran and ran. So yeah, now I'm doing the logger, the early years of the logger. I've been in black dog with Patrick Swayze. I've been in Saturday night live. So I go to the schools and talk, I go to the banquets. I'm not this guy that's been on Saturday night live on and you know, so all these things. So that's how that that happened. And I wouldn't have done it, but um, it worked out great. I but I was smart enough. So I'm gonna stand right next to Will Ferrell, man. And Signorelli said, "Yeah, you guys look good together." Oh yeah, that's a that skill. Was really savvy that yeah. you knew to do that to position yourself right in the in the right place at the right time. Kind of an introvert, kind of quiet. I don't say much, um, you know. So on those sets when I was new, I would just be looking at stuff and if you had an instinct you went for it sometime the instinct wasn't right well that time it worked out that, but that's how i got on saturday night live jason and, and i never got the call to be an extra in the studio which would have been a gas you know? oh, okay yeah well you're you're a very striking person you have a lot of your, your features i mean if you're in a room there's rusty i mean it i mean before we knew who you were but you just are striking in, in general like you have a lot of features that make people look at you <laughs> well i was landscaping one summer and with this guy this modern guy and 
And he knew, and I was been in New York trying to be an actor. And there's a buddy of mine in Vermont. And he said, after work today, I'm going to do some work for the soap opera actor who lives in soap, uh, Stowe Hollow. You want to come? And I didn't have an agent or anything. I was just trying. And uh, I said, no, nah, I don't want to work after work. He said, well, which, you know, you don't want to meet this guy? I said, yeah, I'll meet him. So I go up and there's this guy named Benjamin Hendrickson who'd gone to Juilliard. John Houseman was his mentor. And Mark says, there's my buddy, Rusty. He's, he's trying to be an actor. And Benjamin it's about 45. He looks at me and he said, yeah, you know, you have a good look. That's what you're saying. And I didn't know that. And I said, what? He says, you could be a tough guy, a country bumpkin, a cop. You're very saleable. When you get back to New York in the fall, give me a call. This is how I got commercials. This is no shit. That's how I got my, I got my agent by landscaping in Stowe, Vermont. He said, you give me a call, literally. Wow. And I'll hook you up with my agency, commercial agency. Right. So what did I do, Arena? Yeah, I, I called him. And he said, yeah, Sue King is her name. She works at J. Michael Bloom. I met Sue King. Two auditions, and I'm, and I'm flying to a Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, doing a, a commercial for Renault, where I met Polly Perrette. She, she was on that. She was, And then uh, in another three weeks, I was going to L.A. to do a Kellogg's Cornflakes commercial, all me. I literally got my commercial agent by landscaping. But he did say, wow. you're very saleable. Well, from my, my opinion, everybody's very saleable. You know what I mean? But <laughs> everybody has a look. But uh, he, yeah, he I was like, what does that no, mean? No, I don't agree with that at all. There's a lot of, like, if you, in Vermont, a lot of people look just like the last person you saw in Vermont. Uh, it, 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 and probably <laughs> everywhere it's like that. Not everybody no. has a look. <laughs> Yeah, how do you? But how do you define a look, right? Like who, ha, who well, has it? Who does charisma? Um, well, for instance, I was in a movie with James Coburn, and he has a look. <laughs> um, all right, my acting coach. This is this is meant to be taken as just a label. It doesn't mean sex, but he said it's called fuckability. That's what it is. <laughs> like he goes, Gene Hackman, fuckability. It doesn't mean you want to have sex with them. It's just what you need to be in movies and get cast. It's you can't have not you can't not have that to you know succeed. Yeah, and I think <laughs> and I think Benjamin was saying in my case, Rena, specifically, this mug is a cop. Mm. This mug is a bad guy. This mug is a country boyfriend. You know, th this mug is the uh, I did four Chevy ads like a rock. The smug is the guy that has the two little kids and drives the truck with the cowboy hat on and stuff. That, that's what this mug ended up physical. So that was, it's not only a look, but saleability with that look. You're also the creepy guy that eats worms. Oh, yeah. yeah that was cool. <laughs> <laughs> That was cool. I can actually. that now like talking to you, looking at I can see all of these things that the trucker, the creepy guy eating worms, the cop. I can see it. Yeah, and I think some people the look is saleable maybe just for one thing. You know those commercials where it's the nebbish guy, he always plays the nebbish guy, and you kind of go, I've seen that guy in other nebbish guy parts. The guy's not gonna be the cop. Mm. He's gonna be that guy, or maybe the, yeah. the kid on the you know the 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 third buddy of the guy but hey do you guys mind if i light up a story i'm cool with it yeah, yeah well, it's called the, in the room <laughs> it's it's uh, uh that's your who am i um that's the uh, uh did you take any acting lessons actually <laughs> that's a good question actually because um, right, okay, good i was down there i was like 34 bill was still alive and i was kind of like no nah, i'm doing this job this is a fascinating job you, you can't even believe uh, if i told you but anyway i gotta get into it acting <laughs> I'll name drop. <laughs> Here's the story. I got to get into an acting class. Why? I had been acting. You can always learn. You can always study because I wanted to see what the vibe was, what was going on. I didn't know what was going on. So I, I, I called my friend, John Fusco, who lives in Stowe, good friend. And he, uh, he's huge. He's big. Look him up, Rena. John Fusco, screenwriter. Yeah, young writer. Guy, young, uh, children young of the gods. Is that right? I don't think so. Young Guns uh, 1 and 2, The Babe, Hidalgo. Uh, what was that one, the Bonnie and Clyde one that was out recently with Woody Harrelson? And, and um, oh, anyway, yeah. he's huge. He was doing Thunderheart with Val Kilmer and Sam Shepard at the time. 
And I said, John, man, I want to get into an acting class, but I don't want to be like with a bunch of 18 year olds. He said, I'll talk to Rob, Bob. He was producing Thunderheart with Robert De Niro. I'll talk to Bob and uh, ask him what a, what's a good class for a 34 year old guy who's done stuff. So De Niro tells him George Loris, he does private classes. I get George Loris's assistance number. He says, come meet George Loris downtown. I go to this dark, dingy theater and his assistant says, sit up on that stage. So George Lewis, this guy, a posing guy comes down. Again, I'm still like, I'm new to this. He sits down and he goes, now, who recommended me to you? And I said, well, I got a friend who's a screenwriter and he's producing something with Robert De Niro. Robert De Niro. You know, so he's like checking me out. I said, well, he's a friend of my friend. And he said, you're, you're the guy. And Laura said, well, we do scenes here, and at the end of three months, I invite industry people in. This class, the people are experienced already. I don't know if you are. So if you want a chance to get in my private class, walk over to the other side of the village and enroll at, at Lee Strasberg. I teach a class at Lee Strasberg. When you enroll, tell them you want to be in my class, and I'll audition you through that class he's checking me out and i have i walked right down free go over to lee strasberg got in there and i got into george lawyer's class and i did what he said which was basically to all the students don't do anything when you do the scene don't do the scene just say the words and i did and after about two classes he said you can join my private class so i took uh three months of lee strasberg two classes there and then i studied with george for uh two two times and it was uh it was good yeah i didn't really meet anybody that was a connection or anything but it was fun but that's how i got in you know you use yeah. your use what you can yeah feel free to light up I'm, I, I when i ask you a question you have to stop so i feel bad <laughs> um yeah i uh i did a... i thought it'll be, it'll be cool to see oh yeah definitely i'll give you a little chance while I'm talking. No, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I was in Cameron Thor's and Jock McDonald's acting class in Vermont. Josh, um, I know Jock. Jock, Jock, yeah, I did Terra Nova, a great guy. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Cool really guy. good, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I would love to get him an interview, actually, too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and um, that's where like we learned about the who am i and stuff like that and um and actually it brought me to a question i wanted to ask you about do you have any um particular kind of acting um i guess style or theory that you that you like do you ever do you endow objects and stuff like that or do you just like how do you how do you uh what would you say your style is well that, that's god darn good quick because when i was starting out in doing theater, I kind of really was, I was doing method stuff. I sunk into it, man. And that's why I don't do it anymore. Cause it wasn't, it was freaky. Um, but yeah, I'm sense, uh, sense, uh, sense memory stuff, inner monologue stuff. I did buried child, which is a Sam Shepard play. And I played a real, you know, Sam Shepardy part. And I remember I was in, living in, on Colchester Avenue actually. And, um, I would go to the, uh, PNC at night late and I would, just be that guy and I would, you know, freak the register person out because I, they could see it. So I would really worked on it. And, um, but, the, but basically now the stuff that I do, I just did a movie with Jay Craven called Lost Nation. It's about Ethan Allen. And, so, and I played Asa Locke, the historical character. Anyway, now, you know, I found out, Rena, <laughs> it goes back to the thing we were talking about. When they, I'm not a, getting huge parts. Well, I didn't go that route. I moved out of New York and I did the lager. It's the right decision. But the parts I've gotten and gotten in, in, in movies and TV are because of what I look like. Once they give me the part, I don't have to do anything. So if they say, you're a killer, Rusty, we don't go see a kill. We only have one scene and they talk to you and you're a killer and you light up a cigar. So if I do this, I'm the killer. I don't have to do a fucking thing. <laughs> so, so my style is I don't do a fucking thing. That's good. Film likes that. 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, I did a couple leads in movies, Mud Season and stuff. And you have to, and then you have an arc, and you have to, do, you know, it's, it's more complicated, let's say, than that. I wouldn't want anybody to think I'm downplaying that craft. But uh, at the level that I was doing it, I just have to basically show up and say, Law and Order. I did two Law and Orders. I was a freaking arsonist in one of them, and I was a, a kidnapper. I kidnapped Amanda Pete. I met Amanda Pete. She, she was just starting out. But anyway, I get shot in the back in that one because of what I look like. I didn't have to do a thing. You know, Jerry Orbach, who I bowed down to, and Stan Waterston, they're interrogating me about burning a thing down, and they're just saying their lines, and I'm just saying my lines back to them. So I'm not having to stay up at night on those things and really study. I kind of figured that out. I take it real seriously, and I'm prepared, but, you know, you do a, you, 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 you rehearse, and any, and any director, if most of the um, direction they're going to give most people is, do it a lot less yeah it's hard for a theater person uh to move to film (laughs) really hard it's like they always want to talk to the person in the back and now you're talking to someone that's a couple inches away from you really it's really what it's Mm -hmm. the difference so like you get a theater actor i've cast movies before and you get theater actors and they're like they're like oh my god what are you talking and if and if the horizon is high it's okay. Like if it's like a wacky comedy, then you can be crazy. But like it, my movies, I always made some kind of horror thing or whatever, and you needed to be subtle. And that's what film likes then, you know? So it's, it's a hard transition if you're a theater person, generally. I can't, I can't agree with you more. And, and then the thing is, I, I did theater as a kid. I moved to New York. And uh, when I started doing commercials, I just watched these people. And I, I learned what you said. By just watching them, I said, "Uh oh, I don't have to do that or whatever. You know, I just have to go in the lens, let the lens do the work. And also your wardrobe yep. in the background, the writing, and the lighting. <laughs> I mean, I could also light the cigar and, and, and be the guy that the girl wants to marry, you know. Same fucking guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like that demonstration. Uh, so you said... <laughs> So you said you decided not to go, you went to New York and you decided not to stay there and do that route, right? Of, um, and you went back to Vermont and then you said that was the right decision. So talk about that, like what went into that decision? And then like, how did you start creating the logger and, and um, tell us about so that the, character. The industry work, the commercials, the TV, the movies were happening at the same time that the logger, in fact, I wrote the second act of the first logger on the set of Black Dog, which is a movie with Patrick Swayze and Chuck the Meatloaf. So I was getting work. But this logger thing, apparently, Rena, and probably, I love Vermont. I never really moved to New York City. I love Vermont. You know, I was, I was there all the time, but I, I commute, you know, it was like I was still here. So a very integral part of that answer, this answer is my father 50 when I was born. Now I'm 36. He's 86 at that point living up here my mom 20 years younger but still uh i felt the it was palpable i'd be laying on the on the little thing i was futon one of my apartments in 91st and first and it was palpable the feel to pull and go back there now the logger was just blowing up too to do and here's another answer part of that to do the logger right to answer all the calls from the boy scouts to do the calendar photos to write new material, to drive to 100 miles away and do that show that night, to do that right, well, the way I thought, I had to be here all the time. Sure, I could have said, hey, if you get a good audition for me, innovative artist, call me down there. So you're going to drive down, do a two-minute audition, drive back, you're going to get a call the next day for a call back. It wasn't going to work. I chose that. To say it was the right decision, the other one would have been the right decision too. But a lot of it was family, and a lot of it was because of... Uh, it was a Vermont, and, and I had done a lot of stuff down there. To tell you the truth, I don't like movies as much. Movies and commercial TV, I don't like doing it as much. That's another thing. You get you get in front of 200 people, and I do two hours straight. It's just a different deal. You know, I don't know if you've ever done anything, Rena, but I know Jason has. And uh, that's a different feeling, and I prefer that one. <clears throat> Now you worked with Meatloaf, and didn't he have something to do with you designing the loggers, uh, the show? 
I was right. I wrote the second act of the logger then and everybody asks what you're doing. I got this play. I'm going to do it. I want, I, I don't know what to do. I, 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 you know, I don't have, you know, so meat was going to use a cigar smoker. It's not where I got it from, but oh, he said, well, when I start, what you do is you find a place up there, the rusty nail and stone. And, said, and you know, if you know a guy, tell him that you'll, uh, you'll do the show there and you want a certain amount of money down and part of the door. And yeah, but so, so that, that was that he, he helped me with that. And then I love Merle Haggard and, and meatloaf's driver was this woman who had dated Merle Haggard. She bragged about that. I love Merle Haggard. Patrick, Patrick Swayze stand-in was this ex Marine named Scott. From, he was a Southern guy. He's a more outgoing guy. He said, so she said, why don't you come to the show? Merle was playing up the road, you know, in uh, Georgia, we shot that. And I'll, I'll let you meet the uh, Merle. I'll get you to meet. I'm like, get the, so Scott was like, yeah, we'll go. So we did. She comes to us after the show. Their buses are parked face to face the way they do. She says, well, we can get you to see, I get you to see Merle, but we're going to sit you on this bus for a while. First, I sit on that bus. Who's on that bus? Rena, these names won't mean anything to you till I explain it. Bonnie Owen was Merle's backup singer. I listened to her harmonies since I was 15, 16, 18, driving jump truck. Bonnie Owen was married to Merle Haggard at one point in her life. Bonnie Owen was married to Buck Owens at one point. And Bonnie Owen at that present was married to Fuzzy Owen, who is Merle Haggard's producer, who is on the bus too. So you go on the bus, Bonnie Owen and Fuzzy Owen, they're all over the road. So they're nice as shit. So what do you do? Well, I'm, I'm an actor. I'm doing a play and I'm going to do it around and I don't know what really what I can do. You know, I'm just trying. It's going to be funny. It's about for my, and Fuzzy was like, own it. Don't give any of it away. You keep it. You're saying he was a producer. So I got that information from him too. And then by the way, at the end of that, we were on that bus. So to me, sitting with Fuzzy Owen, who, who, who uh, produced the Beatles, some real famous guy. And they always talk, George Martin, George I Martin. Yeah, it's know. like sitting, it's like a Beatles fan sitting with George Martin. Hmm. And then we went off the bus and I got to meet Merle, but he didn't give me any advice. <laughs> he was nice though. Now, so all these stories are true, man. It's, it's all, that's, that's how I did. Wow. That's amazing. Uh, cause, cause I mean, I mean, you're just a harder worker than I am. Cause I, I did a lot of, I wanted a lot of the same things you did. And I, I just didn't do the work like that. I, I yeah, mean, but remember you're a filmmaker yeah, and a, a musician in a band lightning struck in a bottle i'm a guy i'm fucking mark twain i'm one dude standing there it's a it's a neat you got to plug amps in you got to rent cameras hmm. and how many filmmakers are there just in vermont yeah let alone in the united states and if a goddamn united states there ain't nobody doing you know so so it's a, i'm not just you know trying to say yeah but you, no it's a different thing it's a different thing when I did. It was just the luck of the draw that what I liked to do was this thing that you could. And by the way, Rena, the product was good. Yeah. The shows were good and people went fucking nuts. It hit a nerve. It was playing. It was uh, speaking in deference to the native Vermonter. And when I was in that play, Jew Divine, doing the shows with Vermont Rep, I saw that the native Vermonter liked to see that. They liked to see themselves. That's not why I wrote that. I wrote that because I was a kid. After school, I did the logging and the concrete. And I was attracted to the working class person more than, you know, I'm not doing a show called The Doctor. Though I think doctors are great, men and women uh, alike. But uh, so, yeah, it hit, it hit a nerve. I mean, I do two or three graduation speeches a year, you know. Didn't do one this year, but, yeah. So it, so it sounds like you just really found your niche, right? Like the it just so happened that like whereas like jason with you like what crusty was saying it's you have a lot more competition because it's not such a narrow focus thanks uh, guys you know. <laughs> <laughs> well hey making films let's face it who making films you're a freelance writer arena i mean to sell that is, is like you never see that movie Free Solo with that Alex Humboldt climbing up the rock face without any ropes. It's oh, like climbing yeah. up fucking El Capitan with no ropes, man. Yeah. It's almost impossible. And now it's even 
you know, oh, yeah. more difficult. It's easier because you could be 16, make a whole film on your yeah. phone, and it could be good. But okay, now what? Yeah. Now you have to give with it away for thing, free. <laughs> with my thing, I call up the town hall. I rent the theater. I put up the posters. Everybody knows me, blah, blah, blah. You know, I put, and they, they come, especially in then because there wasn't that much going on. Yeah. Now, when you went around New England, do you ever do you change your act depending on if you're in like Maine or New Hampshire or do you just like or at all or? No, no, because it's just a Vermont guy, who, you know, translate. You know, that's one thing people say, well, people people from out of state don't like it. They've said that for years. Well, that's not true because I'll do banquets and it'll be the, the east, the, the east, the real estate, uh, the top, you know, real estate people of from the east coast. Maryland, Virginia, all the way up at the Sheridan. There's 150 of them. So there's people from all over. I mean, kind of funny is funny. A few things. If I'm talking about deer jacking, Jason, I could put a couple other words in there that explains that. But for the most part, it's just human stuff. I mean, I've done it in front of people from Alaska, you know, and diverse uh, uh, so social backgrounds. You know, it's not just all the uh, certain type of person, but and they laugh. So... When you do your act, is it the same, the same thing every time, everywhere? Do you have different versions? Do you like have, do you switch it out at all? Or you've been doing it for so many years. Have you changed it over the that's, years? Um, yeah, that's a good question. When I first started the first two or three years, it was word for word, comma for comma, because I was just getting it out to everybody. And that was the first video. And then, no, I wrote a, I wrote a whole new show. And that was the second video. And I wrote a whole nother new show. That was the third video. So now I have, um, I can do some of the classics and uh, yeah, I have up to, I have a whole bit about um, getting vaccinated and, and all, so to speak. And I do, it's less Jason, it's less I'm the logger now. It's more, uh, actually, that's a good thing you asked that. It's more me now. I'll go up there and kind of just be me. Instead, I used to, I, the first one was I started out, there's a fourth wall. So it was a theater show and I didn't go out. Now I do crowd work. And it's just me and I, I'm out in the lobby when people come in. So I'm watching stuff and I can, I can call on what I saw this guy doing before. So it's a, so there's a, it's a multi media theater show. And so it's much different, but no, no, I, I'm yeah, always write new stuff. And then, and then there's that part of it. There's the co comedian part of it where you write stuff here. And then, I don't know, I think it's funny. And then I have to do it. Uh, I did a 50th, high school reunion Saturday and I didn't try any new stuff there, but you know, I have a 90 minute show to do at banquets and um, I'll try five minutes of new stuff and I'll see what worked in it and what didn't. And then next thing you know, in two years, that five minutes is really funny. Now that's you... what Jerry, Jerry Seinfeld does that same shit you oh, know, yeah. before he does this, that they all go and they just work out. Do you, um... I like to go to the, comedy store and, oh yeah you know all the time, like out here because i like i i think that's really cool to watch them in that process and i've seen like a couple people a couple times and you see them tweaking it and it's i think that's pretty cool but i back it up with an hour and 15 minutes of strong stuff see that i you know so i can i can fail Do but yeah it's interesting because you don't have that like lab you know so to speak that like right. whereas like these comedians can go to to like the improv or the laugh factory or you know comedy store you have to try it like at each gig yeah. so that sounds even more challenging yeah i mean i could go to the uh vermont comedy club there's a comedy club now, i'm actually an investor there jason but oh. i know them those folks i could go there but you get five minutes arena yeah you're right so it's all oh yeah oh. so yeah and these guys and girls can go to the con they go you know the john stewart they'd go to the comedy store and then they'd get on the subway and go to the danger fields and then get go back into the 11 o'clock show yeah man they're they're getting that stuff honed fast so yeah i got especially now i don't have a show i got a show the 16th and then i have a show the 25th where and, uh, the 16th is on it on my truck my mac truck shows i have a mm -hmm. mac truck now and um it's outside it's a benefit for the highgate library so that's in highgate you'll see you'll see it on facebook It'll be oh fun. yeah and then the 25th is in Guild Hall. You know where Guild Hall is? It's Sounds in the kingdom. Familiar. Oh, it's in the no. kingdom up, by, up by Lancaster, New Hampshire. In fact, we shot Stranger in the Kingdom. We shot the courtroom stuff up in Guild Hall. That was back when I was 38 years old. 
and that's where I worked with Mark Sheen right, right in that place. But anyway, so I have those two and I, I'm, and I'm, I'm constantly reading constant, you know, not constantly because I don't have to do it constantly now, but today I called a farm stand in Sheldon. They've had me appear there the last three summers. I just come up with my guitar to their, they have a client day, but now I said, Hey, why don't, can I bring my truck up and do a show there? I'll produce it. And you know, all the farm stand people will be so there it is. So I'm going to do that one. Smugglers Nuts Distillery. They make uh, spirits. They're another sponsor. I'm going to do my truck show out behind their place in Jeffersonville. So it's always, it's constantly producing. Most of the work is the producing, obviously. It's like when you're making a movie. <laughs> yes. yeah. So everything you do is, it's all live. Like it's not like somebody also films it and puts it on video or something. No, I had a buddy lived here. Uh, he's in his mid thirties for a year and a half. And he was going with me and it was great. And I could do this myself too. And he would shoot me on stage. And then I'd put 17 seconds of that on Instagram and stuff. And that was pretty good. And I could set up my camera and do that too. But I'm, uh, I'm very content with the model I have now. And I don't, and I I do the Instagram stuff and, and everything, but you notice if you watch my Instagram, I'm not being, I'm not funny. <laughs> I'm just myself. And uh, people don't mind that. But yeah, well, no. it's mostly like, like, people. Well, when you're on Instagram, I mean, I've seen a lot of them. You're just talking, but people already want to know you. So it's, it's sort of celebrity talking on Instagram is what it is. <laughs> so of course. Right. And, and I know a lot of them. Yeah. Oh yeah. When I do live, they're just, they're, well, you, you're, Hey Jason. And, and then yeah. I always say, so Jason's a guy I worked with. He's a filmmaker and a musician. He's got a family and, and you know, and he's a cool guy and uh, blah, 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 whatever. And so I talked to, and then a, a story will come up. I actually ate worms on, you know? Yeah. So it's just, I mean, nobody, I'm not a genius sitting here saying, you know, it's amazing what folks will watch, but um, I'm always uh it's like when I first started out, I said, I'm not a Vermonter. or somebody, a really well-known Vermonter who's in the business said, you don't, don't let people know you're not a Vermonter. And I drove home from that meeting with him. He's a mentor. And I said, no, nope, I'm going to go the other way. I, I can't be doing that. That's stolen valor. Yeah. Yeah. I think that sounds like the right call because then when somebody, if somebody finds out that, and, and they really care about that, then that is like a, a breach of trust. So yeah, honesty yeah. is best, definitely. And this guy didn't know this thing would have that much legs. You know, he thought maybe I was going to do seventeen shows and just, but so it made more sense. Yeah. Now you also wrote two books, mm -hmm. and you said For earlier sure. you're not a writer. <laughs> What's going on? Well, How... well, editors, yeah, so... Jason. <laughs> editors. <laughs> well, right. When I was in New York, I needed to get a radio station behind me. And I was still working. I was running the elevator. Bill was gone and I was writing the logger. And I sent stuff to WOKO, Jason. It's a country station you know, up here. It was just turned to country. And the GM got back to me. He said, yeah, I'll, I'll maybe sponsor you. You know, send me your stuff. So I went right to Kathy Doyle, six hours away, the boss at that point. I said, Kathy, I got this meeting. And I could go and come and go anytime I wanted because I was doing auditions. I got to go up and I got to go to Vermont by tomorrow. So I went up, put that and I didn't put my stuff on his desk. I was there. And he said, yeah, you can call in and we'll sponsor you for these next five shows and call in in the morning. And I left that office that day, the station. I said, well, if something ever happens with this, I could be calling in all, you know, once a week. And I've been calling in once a week for 26 years in that radio station. But I was on that radio station. A publisher who had the six papers over in Elizabethtown, New York, across the lake arena. He called me up. He said, hey, uh, would you like to write columns? I said, well, I'm not a writer. He says, well, just, I got a whole, have a whole bit about that. It's kind of funny, but anyway, I don't know adjectives or verbs. That's what I mean. I didn't know I could put together a column. And I said, yeah, I'll try it. If I can write about anything I want, and it can be as long as I want it to be or short as I want it to be, and no one edits it. And he said, yeah. So for seven years, I was in six papers. I was making like 300 a week, just writing columns. But I would only do it if they were going to be good. So I remember the day that I, I was walking down the street in Burlington and somebody rolled down the window and said, Hey, Ross, I really like your column. So I was like, all right, they're, they're okay. So then I got enough of them. 
I thought, if these go good, I can collect them into a book. So those are reworked columns collected into two books. There's like 90 stories in each book, self-published, not edited, edited for commas. And if do you, do you capitalize pop tart, but not, but not edited, take this paragraph out, put this here. Cause here again, Rena, we go back to the honesty. I'm not, Christopher Hitchens, you know, I'm not, I'm not a writer's writer. So if you're going to, if I'm going to sell you something, it's not going to be something that I wrote. And then some real writer came and made it right. It's going to be wrong. Right. You know? Yeah. One of them's called scrawlings. Scrawlins. Scrawlins. And the second one is scrawlings two T O O. I credit my mom for uh, coming up with that title. Hmm. T O O. Yeah. Nice. The, and they sell still. And you know, I read them now. They're pretty, pretty good. <laughs> nice. That's great. Yeah. And you also. So that's how that happened. And again, I took the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Now yeah. for music, that's not part of the logger, right? The, the, your, the, the music that you it do? Is, it is now. I was a drummer. So here's the music thing. So now I play the guitar, you could say. So about 10 years ago or 12 years ago out of the 26 years or 13, 15, I was doing the logger for a while and I said, Hey man, I'm going to have a talent show, variety show, variety show, the logger. And I did that for a while. And I got a band together, uh, probably guys, some guys, you Mark Lurvey, some guys you might know. Anyway. And I had a guitar. I bought a, uh, I had a Laravé and I was really, so I got, I got a guitar when my dad went into the nursing home, he was 92 and I was 42 and I bought a guitar so I could learn a couple chords and do like the um, hymns, you know? on a hill far away so i did that and then then i got pretty good at it and i had a i have a fiddle player that opens up my show for years i did and then he started i'd go to his house and i'd back him up on the fiddle and then i'd start singing merle haggard you know i'm proud being okay so that stuff is right in the ball is the wheelhouse of the people that watch me so i started adding the guitar little by little and now 15 years later I can actually play, play the guitar pretty good. And, and I hooked up with Patrick Ross and we've done a lot of musical stuff. So, so yeah, Jason, when I do the truck show in Highgate, I have bought two speakers and uh, I'll play a couple songs. Yeah. Oh, low battery. Uh Oh, and I had it charged right up. Anyway, we'll go as long as we can. No, oh, I, yeah. I can, I can you plug, plug it, in. it in. Oh, sure. <laughs> By the way, speaking of guitar, um, Andre McCarra says, hello. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. oh. uh, your sound is weird right now i think it needs to get a little you. bit well. what'd you say uh after i said andre said hi wow you just actually disappeared that was... <laughs> like, <you> just vanished. <laughs> that was... wow and he's also a magician <laughs> i just said talk talk among yourselves <laughs> there's that that, that... Hey, this is so cool you guys that are teaching me all about crazy, this technical the way, stuff. That, the way that that just happened visually for us like <laughs> yeah you were you were there and then you just went pop and you were gone it was so weird <laughs> oh my oh, god hopefully hopefully this is working yeah it's go it looks good right now and everything and yeah yeah now you did you work with andre or uh um no. or did you just yeah, one of my guitar players did when I had that big band and he came in and played a couple of tunes, yeah. Oh wow, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah he's good. Yeah. And um, and of course you know Tim, Tim Cavanaugh. Because mm -hmm. he said hello as well. <laughs> well, that was another thing. Tim Cavanaugh arena is friends with Jason and everything, and he's a great guy, and he had his own Johnny Carson show. He he produced that himself. He would, and uh that was just when my thing was hot. I was the first guest. So I would be on every year during my birthday and you just could. Your it sandwich. wasn't an effluvia of content. So if you had a thing, <clears throat> people were seeing your thing. And then you would be on Tim McAvanaugh's show and then you would be on CAX the next time you're coming out with a new logger show. And then, you, and then I did a, a tour of the jails. I did four tours of our seven jails over wow. the course of this this career yeah so You're like johnny when, cash know, three years into it i went into those jails and i did all that stuff and contacted the jail people and everything you know. wow oh, well. god you're what a hard worker yeah what was that like 
it was good. Um, you don't ever want to go to jail because uh, the atmosphere is is uh, it's not good. You know, the air isn't good. But I'll tell you what it was like. This sounds cliche, but of any audience, those those guys came up to me, and there's one woman's. The women's jails were the most um, crazy. I'll tell you what. So um, they come up, hey man, thanks for coming in. Thanks for coming in. And then I'll be walking on the street. And again, you don't, it's hard to tell. It's hard to understand how small this place is. Uh, you know, I'll be walking through a store and a lady will come up to me and go, hey, my husband's up in St. Johnsbury. You did your show up there. Thanks for doing that. You know, so they're very appreciative. The women's jail, <clears throat> There were some urban women and there were some Vermonter women and they were at odds. So now I'm a guy going in there with a the cut off shirt and doing some, you know, mildly sexual selling sort of sexuality. Yeah. And he's and ripped like, too. He, he's a, he works wait. out. So do you have a, <laughs> let me ask this, let's back up. Do we have a different show for the women's prison than we do for the men's prison or do we have the same show? <laughs> No, different calendar too. To <laughs> or it could be the same, you know. You know. You're like in pause mode just now, so you might want to. Look. You have to remember, these Vermont had grown up. Say, say they're eighteen to twenty-four. They'd grown up watching my videos mm. at Christmas time with their parents, so they knew me. This is a big fucking deal, and I've been in movies. Right. The urban women didn't know me, but the urban women were sure as hell going to laugh louder than those Vermont women. And it became really full of uh, a lot of energy. You can get on, on and Google seven days, did a big article of my jail tour, and she describes it really well. It was actually the guy's jail. So I would do crowd work and everything. So you can also, you can go out and do crowd work with these girls, Rena, and you could really spice it up. And, and uh, there is a fucking... You know, at any moment, the lid could come off and the guards were standing right there. The oh, guys wow. weren't like that. Hmm. So did you have, this is wildly interesting. <laughs> 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 so what was the most memorable moment out of, or were, were there one or two moments that really you stuck mean, out? At the jail? Yeah, at the jail. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, kind of a benign one, but like one of the first jails I'd done, like I said, I was doing graduation speeches. <clears> one <throat> of the first jails I did, I forget where it was, maybe Newport, and they had me in this little gym. And again, the, you know, the climate is very dingy. And the guys are sitting on the floor in the gym. And, uh, and I'm doing my show and I look down and I say, Nick, this guy, Nick, I recognized him. Well, a month earlier, I'd, He'd been in a class that I did the graduation speech for. Oh, that's Nick. that's sad. yeah. So I said, I said, hey Nick. He's like, hey, and I said, just reflex, reflex. I, I said, how's it going? And he goes, not too good. So uh, that was pretty interesting at the time. And oh. also the first jail I did, I forget which one it was in a gym again, but a normal sized gym. The end of the gym, there was a room that went like beyond the gym and it was the it was the, the weight room so i was in that little weight room off to the side so when they sat at half court you know 75 of my i'd do like four shows in these four full hour shows four hours because they couldn't mix certain criminals or the other criminals but anyway the first one i ever did there had just been an article debbie solomon used to write for the free press jason and she did an article that I was going to do these jail tours. And it was all about my career. And the, so I was back lifting weights and these guys are fil filing in. And I was 38 at the time. And uh, I was pumped. And I kind of look out there, nerve, I was nervous. And then all of a sudden, just about before I was going to go on, they started rusty, rusty. <laughs> they were intimidating, trying to intimidate me, right? Because They'd read, oh, so, so they'd read about me in the free press and everything. And some of them, you know, there's some guys from the city and everything, and they're doing that. So I'm kind of like, well, this is uh, 
a chance to wither or a chance to learn something. So <clears throat> I walk out and the guy says, okay, we're going to have an entertainer as rest of the week. I walk out like sort of a quarter of a court and they were like chuckling and rusty. And I just stood there and looked at them, didn't say a word. And they quieted down and then I did my thing. So that was memorable. I just went into it. Oh, you, so just, just, you just waited? <laughs> I, sh I showed I was not intimidated. Mm. Yeah, the most powerful thing you can do is nothing. Mm. Yeah. And that's the most interesting thing, too. <laughs> so the, it, instead of going out there and go, ah, you think you're going to intimidate me? Look at this. I was just back there lifting 300 pounds. Not the right thing to do, maybe. Mm. I just went out there and stood there. Wow. Take your shots. Mm. So those are two memorable things. Wow. And the women's jails. But get read that article. It's a good article. Yeah, if you send it to me, I, I'd like to read it. Uh, what made you decide to to go to the jails and perform? Well, it's part part because don't forget, I speak in benevolence to the working for the working class. And there's certainly white other people who are in jail, but um, that those are the people who I'm interested in, and I also think that that um they're paying they're paying they're, pay, they're paying their dues why should they not be entertained and i have something that's entertaining and also it was another way to call up the big paper in the state and say guess what i'm doing i'm doing a tour of the jails so they send a reporter over to my house and we talk all about it and they catch you out there again at a time when if you were on the front page of the living section ah and hey is worth that now it ain't worth shit because the first of all the papers you know who reads the papers second of all if there's something halfway interesting that's gonna maybe hold someone's attention for well they won't even read it you know, and then there's something the next day. There's a uh, Roe versus Wade, which is uh, unfortunate. You know, and there's uh, Afghanistan. So it just wasn't like that back then. So it was part marketing, but it, but most of it was, and also a challenge. And also that's kind of the the uh, cliched thing to do when you're my type of entertainer. Johnny Cash, the first thing Jason said, goes into the jails. That's where Merle Haggard, Merle Haggard, who I love, was in jail when, Folsom, when Johnny Cash came and performed. And Merle <laughs> said to himself, I got to get my shit together because I, you know. Oh, wow. That's kind of a good yeah, story. Yeah, that's. But I did, yeah. I, did, I did it seven times. I just didn't do it once and get that big pop early on. So then seven days, five years later, did another whole feature article. You know, wow. They don't really. I, I tried it about it during the COVID. They didn't, but I tried it before COVID, and it's much more strict. The bureaucracy doesn't really. I guess that they're just not interested in having me come in there right now. Mm. Yeah, COVID must have been a dry spell for you if you like doing live shows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so COVID hit. I'm a single guy. Uh. And I don't really have to work, let's say. So it didn't affect my life. It affected the job. Didn't really matter. What I thought of at the time was all the people that were just, you know, in all these new uh, beer places and that whole scene. Uh, if you play uh, the guitar, Alley T, if you play and you play in a, a, a room and you do three of those a night and you're getting, let's say, 100 bucks. That's three hundred dollars. You got a kid at home. That shit was wiped out for these people because they had a normal job, but that extra money. So I was like, "Boy, this is bad." But uh, yeah, you know. So that's what I bought the truck. The first year of COVID came. I was delivering. I saw this Mack truck. I said, "I got to get my CDL, and I'm going to go around to Town Greens. I'm going to put a trail." flatbed on them. I'm going to book myself in town greens and I'm going to take my show outside 
because that's the only chance I get. And we got to keep doing this. So I bought the Mack truck, put that together. And that's a whole new thing that I got fucking on CAX because of that. The whole other thing. So do you do all the engineering, the sound engineering, or do you have somebody work with you for that? On the don't truck? ever come to a truck show, Jason, because you'll be like, oh boy, he don't know what he's doing. Now I have one of those little, right? I have one of those little, P, what's that, little PV thing. And I have a friend who's really good, Peter Wilder, and he's, he taught me how to do it. So, you know, I just play the guitar and sing. Oh, yeah. that's fine. This, this is not, it's just like, it takes me five minutes to plug that stuff in. Mm, okay. Two speakers. Yeah. Oh, I see you don't have a PA. Well, I guess my microphone goes into the PV thing. Right. And the microphone comes out the two speakers and the guitar also oh, okay. goes and comes out. That's a PA. I got a mark. I got a triple O 17 that you can plug in. I have a D 28. that's acoustic that has no holes in it. So I, I use that in, in, the, in the halls. It's really acoustic, really nice. I don't plug in. Um, now and I never use them. I never used a mic when I was starting out for years and years and years. I did these theaters and town halls. I did the Burlington high school, no amplification because mm. I grew up doing theater. Yeah. Yeah. Paid for that. Paid for that a couple of times. I'd get so weak that my body would get weak and then I would get sick, but I'd still push it out there, man. Oh, yeah. You know? And my audience seeing me sick, working hard. They love that. Mm hmm. Yeah. Now, as uh, now, what do you do for activities in Vermont? Do you hunt? Not a hunter. Never had been a hunt. Not opposed to hunt. I'm pro hunt. Um, probably you could say I'm pro gun uh, if it's done right. Um, no, I I do a, that ride. I do the heart. And uh, now I'm older. I don't. I used to do weights, but I do very little weights and I, I hike. Do all that stuff that people do in Vermont. Hike. I have a fairly good sized property that can keep you busy and uh but that's that's what i do uh, i like to read i'm in the bar most every night got classical music on and write my stuff and it's very introverted lifestyle uh, very calm and i go to town every day and uh do errands and see people in town to integrate into the, in the, in the people the town is stow that i would go to and uh I go to Burlington once or twice a week. Go to I go, I go to Stone Soup. I love Stone Soup. I go over to Tom Gr just get the vibe, have my meetings over there. But that's really the only um, social socialization, I guess. Oh. I'm not tripping the life fantastic. <laughs> oh God. Yeah, well, it's like uh, it's interesting that you don't hunt because like uh, the first thing I would think is that you're you're a hunter. I don't know why, but <laughs> <laughs> the uh, the first story I did that put me on the map was about deer jacking the, the deer jacket story. Mm, that's probably why. So actually. yeah, no, not a not a hunter. I could not kill. I'm a such a freaking pussy man. It's yeah, unbelievable. I'm that way too. Is, oh my god, it's almost ridiculous. Yeah, yeah I'm not gonna so, shoot things. <laughs> so this is probably a very like city person question, but <laughs> what do you do with the tractor? Right. The tractor I plow, it has a bucket on the front. And I guess the thing, you can't really see it, but there's a weird looking thing on the back of that. And that's a winch, W-I-N-C-H. And uh, you cut down a tree, it's like this. You hook a chain to it, oh. you pull a cord, and that winch brings that tree to the tractor. And then you drag that tree to a log landing. Then you cut those that tree into these big stumps and they dry for two months. I'm about to, I have a bunch of logs. I'm about to cut them up. And then you split them in October. And I do all that by hand and split them by hand for, for exercise. Wow. So it's plowing and keep it, I have a good view. So I keep that view down, keep picking trees, right. you know, because that shit grows up. What do you do with, course. what do you do with the, with the wood after that? Do you sell it or do you work, do you build stuff? No, I, I cut I cut the logs into blocks. It's called blocking it up. So you know, 18 inch logs. There's the long logs, and then I cut it into 18 inch sections. They dry in the hot summer sun. And then I split them and I burn them in the wood stove ah. in the winter mm -hmm. in the barn. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know if you were also a carpenter. 
<laughs> I have all these no. like pre preconceived notions about you. <laughs> I'm not not a no. I'm actually very uh, you know I like tag he wear watches. I you know I lived in New York City for you know I have a the house is pretty goddamn fancy. People shit when they see my house. It's not, you know it's right pretty but really having nice. seen your show though i this is my this is my picture that you're destroying of <laughs> of you i picture you like going out hunting grabbing a deer putting it over your shoulder walking in slamming it on the table you got to build the shed tomorrow and you got a bunch of stuff to do out in the garden tomorrow so the tractor and the like i that that's what my image always was because of the show really i mean i mean you know which is probably a good thing <laughs> that's the biggest compliment I could get. And that's, that was one of the marketing things I decided, like I said, after about six or seven years, I wanted to, I was very confident in letting the people know that I had lived in New York city for 11 years, that I had worked at an auction house, that I am substance free, that I am. So I let that out. I know Paula Routley and Pamela Polston before they were seven days. And I would let those things out. That was a, in a nice, I have a wicked, nice house. They came up, Paula did a whole article, Diamonds and Rusty, you could Google that one too, on my lifestyle. That's I a let great that out there. headline. I really like that headline. So that, what that did, Jason, Rena, is that, oh, I thought, well, you can keep letting people think he's that guy, or you can expand your audience to people who think he's that guy. I don't want to go see that show too. Oh my God. He... he Oh, there's, there's something else about that. He's pretty interesting. So now those people started inviting me to do things and I do motivational talks. So I let that out and it was a good move. So there's two parts of, of the thing that you're selling, you're selling more, you're selling more. Oh, oh that's great. Wow. Do you ever uh, do any requests? Like do, can people ever like, request to do a bit or anything? Or is that something where you're like, oh, I'm not just going to do a part like i know rena was saying she wanted because to... i'm about to ask you to do a bit <laughs> well let me see i can do the character i can uh i'll do the i'll do the first little part and you'll get the idea of a story i, I wrote about a guy i wrote it in this riding the subway when i and it's uh yeah so i'll do the character i got a friend named Lidl. we call him Lidl because he's Lidl. he says he's very little he's got little eyes Little teeth, a little bit of hair up on top of his head sticks up a little. But mostly the reason I call him little is because don't no matter what's going on around him, he's always got a little, little smile going. Little's home life is rugged. His father from the south, an auctioneer of cattle, a part-time pastor, drove Little's mother crazy literally into the loony bin. Because he would always either be forever practicing auctioneering or pastoring or both. I often supped Sunday suppers at Little's house. His father presided. I put the kerchief in. Ding, 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 ding. Pass the mashed potatoes. Ding, 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 ding. Pass the mashed potatoes. Get them over here. Put them down here. Helen here. Hey, ho, oh, hey, hey. Hey there, little. Hey there, little. Get him on right now. Get him up high. Oh, what are we going to have? Hey, little, we got a roast beef here. I got a gravy. I got a mashed potatoes. I got a corn in the back. I got a corn in the back. I got a peas in the back. I got a corn and a peas in the back. I'm going to bring them up front. I'm going to put them down here. What are we going to do now? Little, we're going to pray to the Lord. Dear Lord, thank you so much for having Helen prepare this traditional Sunday dinner. I got my favorite things here. I got a roast beef here. I got a gravy. I got a mashed potato. Little, going to eat them all down. Going to be a big, big, strong man like his pappy is our father. Who art in heaven? How will it be? I forty dollars. I got a forty dollars. I got five and forty-five. I got a bit of fifty dollars. I got a corn and a peas. I got to put them in my mouth, and I got to chew them in the front. And little, don't feed the dog from the table. So, Lord, Amen. So that's the first part of a. You story. could actually put that to music. That sounded like somebody should be going. That was. So he's his father's the auctioneer and the pastor, and then further on in that show, further on in that story. Rena, uh, uh, so little, little, little's got a one-legged dog. Dog's got one Wait, leg. One leg. One, one leg. leg. Missing. Three. I've seen lots of three, three-legged dogs. I have not right. seen. One. So that's how it goes, and they love it. One-legged dog. Dog's got one leg. Missing three. Dog's name's Craig. 
hedgehog trap eliminated is right. So it goes on. And at the end of that part, Little takes the dog out for his afternoon drags. <laughs> and they go up, they go up the mountain and it becomes very beautiful because Little is the reason he's got one leg. And I go on and tell he he, he was drunk and he wrote, drove over the dog with his mower and he sent. Oh, go so, ahead. So, so it's, that, that's one of the best stories because it has a, it has a lot of poignancy and, uh, but that's a little bit of the Garrison Keillery type story that I have. I also do jokes that coming at you more, but that's, it's a, it's a kind of a mix between Garrison Keillery and the Larry the Cable guy. So I'm not like Larry the Cable, he, he uses a lot of foul language, but I don't so much. Do you try to keep politics out of your show? Jason, I don't try to keep politics out of my show. I um, uh, that's not where I go. I just don't go there. Right. I can bring in a couple of things that are, uh, you know, that represent the the moment in time and pop out a couple of things. But I, 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 I yeah, I, I, I don't. You don't know where I stand politically, although you know where I stand on social issues, that is to say, gay marriage and all the new, the transgender stuff. I'm very, very liberal on, on that stuff. And, and I, I was never afraid to say that in front of my maybe more conservative core, but not politics. That's a, yeah, that's just a choice. I mean, you, you start to say where you are politically and people can shut down and that's not doing them any favors. No. Uh, yep, I know that firsthand. <laughs> yeah. okay. You've seen my Facebook posts, I'm sure. <laughs> I was about to say, I have seen your Facebook, Jason. And <laughs> you see a lot of people shutting down in those comments. Yeah, well. Yeah, and, and have at it. But also, but also, that's just not my, that's, I'm not going, I don't want to get into politics. Th that's blah, 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 Trump, Biden. No, I just don't naturally have that intelligence or, th or think did you know i know if, if i did it's not would, on your radar kind of not on my radar if i did i probably would still choose to not go there in this business hmm. it's but smart I don't have a, <laughs> yeah i mean it makes sense to as a creative what you're doing you don't necessarily have to bring that in that's not your your area whereas like other yeah. fields you know i mean politics is is everything it is our life so there are lots of fields where you have to let that in because out of necessity but yeah i can see entertainers it you can make that choice whether you're gonna go there or not but it's it's interesting that you um, let people know where you stand on social issues too how does that play with a very conservative audience when the gay marriage thing came down, I had a great joke. I can't tell it to you because I forget it, but it was really good. It was right down the middle. It was saying, it was saying, it was basically saying, don't throw the stone. You know what I mean? And it worked. By the way, if you have two hours of material and you're only doing 30 seconds of that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I have a whole routine about Priuses. So that's the the conservative getting after the Prius, but even the people that frick and drive Priuses are dying laughing. And I see them, you got a Prius, you know, and then they go off. And, and then I have a, I have a whole routine about um, rich white people. And I go, you know, it's not cool to like rich, this is paraphrasing, it's not cool to like rich white people, but blah, 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 blah. I said, I'm a rich guy, I'm a rich white guy. And you can feel it to somebody. We're all rich to somebody. The homeless guy sleeping on the concrete, on the sidewalk looks across the street to the homeless guy who's sleeping on the collapsed refrigerator box inside a sleeping bag and says, look at that rich homeless guy. And then that routine goes on to skiers. I grew up in Stowe, Vermont. So I, I grind the edges off by saying, I know, I say, I know it's not good to say that there's only rich white people ski because then it's saying other type of people don't. I'm not saying that I'm saying predominantly I'm from Stowe, Vermont. It's rich white people. And then I go on and on about it. You know, I was at, I was at a ski event, 18,000 18, of us at the at rich white people standing at the finish line. I was looking around thinking, if I was looking for gluten, I'd be screwed right now. <laughs> that, 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 event, that event was so rich 
the snow looked beige, you know. <laughs> so, so I fuck with, so I fuck with rich white people, because most of the people in my audience, most of the people aren't in my audience aren't rich white people, and if there are rich white people in the audience, they don't mind because they're fucking rich. <laughs> and I could say that, I would say that right on stage, and it's comedy. So I guess it's, uh, I guess it's how you present stuff. That's not to say yeah. you say stuff. And people will take it the way they want. And whenever anybody has had a problem with my stuff over the years, mostly early on, I would never go, no, 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 you're, you're wrong. This is what, this is what I mean. What I would say is if that's how you heard it, that's what you heard. And that's what that joke is to you. And I never apologize. So I'm sorry if I offended you because I'm fucking not sorry if I offended them because they chose to be offended. What I will say to them is, here's the joke written out. Look at it. And if so, once you start with something that somebody wants to get prick, their ears pricked up on, they automatically hear what they want to hear. But if they, if you write it out, they'll see that it's deftly written as to not offend. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I don't, I, I think people like honesty and um, sincerity more than anything else. And if you offend them, you're not going to make everybody happy. No one really can. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like, a, you know, not every comedian or performer is for everybody. And, you know, like, and part of the whole nature of being a comedian is like pushing the envelope or making people think in different ways. So I very much agree with like, you know, it's okay for, for you to push those limits there because you're you're at a comedy show you're not like you know this is not like the nightly news or you know other avenues where it's maybe not okay to, to push the right. envelope like that oh your your picture went away and then it came back <laughs> now it's your what's hand what's going on here <laughs> he's uh showing us part of the live show it's gotta, it's gotta go when i put the charger in it's gotta go boop and it's not going boop. So it just told me there's 10 seconds left again. Oh, okay. 10%. 10 left. Uh oh. Oh, okay. So I, if I can hold on, the light's going to go out because it, it works <laughs> over in that plug. Oh. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> I love it. It it's works in this huge one. Huge barn, too. Yeah, it's really nice in there. Yeah, I'm like maybe also because I've been living in like cities for too long. Every time I go, I'm like, wow, it's huge. <laughs> yeah. But it does look huge. Oh, there's no power in the other wall or something with the with the charger, probably. This thing doesn't. Do you have that with your phone? Sometimes it just doesn't. Yeah, pull it out and turn it around and put it in the other way sometimes. <laughs> Oh wow! Do you have a? It could, be that, it could be that we don't have much time. Yeah. Well, we're we're about at the two hour mark. Yeah. So it, yeah, yeah. We, we normally do these up. for two hours. And then there's the whole. I'll ask a question for you. Then there's the whole, me too stuff, and uh, in my early stuff, I was I, I sexualized, um, stuff, more, and I have uh, I've ground the edges down on on that stuff for sure. Um, I was, I don't think I was ever doing anything that wasn't, uh, being said in the lobby, but, uh, yeah, you, I'm, I'm much more concerned about doing, doing that type of stuff. You know, I, I sell thongs, Rena, that I've sold thongs Rena, and they sold, <laughs> they sold wicked. They have my little image on the thong part. And do you have and would, one that you can show those for the right? audience? <laughs> and I like, you know, thongs are 12 bucks, six bucks a crack, you know? So oh I can God. say that, I can <laughs> say that to some audiences, but I, but I'll figure out the temperature there. Yeah, more, but I was never vulgar or, but, but yeah, I would, I would get people out of the audience and uh, I would have women in my count. I made my first count, as I told you, I, one month I was always naked. I made a decision. The first calendars I was going to make, the naked shot, I was naked. The women, too, always were fully clothed. One time I had a sap bucket covering me. The women were in fully clothed. 
But then people started coming up to my fairs and my shows and looking at the calendar and they'd go try to go right to the naked one. Men and women both would go, how come them girls got all their clothes on? <laughs> but then the last three or four calendars, I had the gals in, in a, you know, more revealing stuff. But when I would hire them, I would say, the photographer is in his house, his wife is there, his kids. You will never see me naked. Oh, because I'm not naked. I have a, I have a jock strap on and, and then the thing. But I said, I will be behind you. And I would never meet them at my house. I never did any of that stuff, man. And I don't, and that was even before this. And I don't know, I was just being professional. It's not that I didn't want to, but um, so that, that worked, but I would never do a, a picture now. Probably I'm 61 years old too, with a, with a, some, a woman or, or a man scantily clad next to me. So with the, the naked count, it was a different month every year was the naked month. The first year was December. It was, I had a little Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> I was holding a little, you know, and, uh, I forget the, what the, I wrote content to it. It's pretty funny. But anyway, and then there's two w women, they were dressed in elf costumes. You know, that's still Dean Martin. I, I like, I really love Dean Martin. I grew up in the sixties and I loved those guys because they were very talented movies, dancing, singing. They weren't Brad Pitt. I met Brad, worked with Brad Pitt. Nice guy, but he don't sing. He don't fucking dance. You know what I mean? So I liked those guys and I grew up watching their shows and that shit was just not good woman wise, you know? So I did choose to do some of that because I was a 38, 40 year old guy. <laughs> And it sold, you know? Yeah. It, it, it sold. Times have definitely changed quite a bit. I, I watched Top Gun the other day, and that that movie, that would not work now. And the same the same movie, the way it's written, wouldn't work now at all if, if like, you know, Tom Cruise was not unknown and stuff. It's so misogynistic. It's insane. <laughs> what's, what's striking to me now, I think, is, like, I'll watch stuff from years ago, and it's it's almost like like even as a woman like i didn't realize how misogynistic and like bad things were you know like i mean even what like what did i watch like ally mcbeal or doogie how you know some of these things will pop up on hulu or what you know and you're watching even shows from like the 90s or you know maybe like late 80s and i'm like whoa <laughs> yeah what the hell? You, and but you just didn't notice it back then. It was just no. that was just like the way it was. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever watch a movie from the 30s? Guys would slap the woman and the woman yeah. thought it was their fault. Yeah. Yeah. Or well, be really aggressive with them and then suddenly they're turned on. <laughs> so, one, one, yeah. one more story. One one more quick story. And this might go off and then I won't be able to say goodbye, but thanks for having me. Oh, oh, right. One more, sir. I was talking to my friend the other night and he said, Well, oh, I just watched the Bond movie and Carrie Lowell was in it. Carrie Lowell was married to Richard Gere. She was married to Griffin Dunn. She was on Law and Order for a while. And uh, I did the interrogation scene with Jerry Arbach and Benjamin Brett and uh, Sam Waterston. And Carrie Lowell was looking through the window the way they do. They watched interrogations. But on the set, I could see her too. We could see them too. You can't in a real interrogation. And during one of the setups, she flashed us. Because they, they had a little repartee, they worked with, and I was the guest star, and she she just had a, a underwear on, bra, but she flashed us. So I'm, you know, I mean, like, she did that, you know. Yeah. Um. So it was just a really gray. Yeah. The guys that got in trouble, it wasn't gray. Yeah. They were just bad, but it, it, it was a weird deal, I'm sure back then. And but anyway, I don't do that. I, I've pulled back on that. Partly because of my age, it's not going to sell. <laughs> if I have twenty-year-old girls, you know, googling, googling, I mean, yeah. Well, yeah, I don't want the I don't want the camera to just shut off and then us not have to say goodbye. So I feel, so, yeah, <laughs> we maybe can talk. We'll we do should... it again. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, God, how can yeah. people find? Like, is there anything? Do you want people to follow you? I know most of your stuff is live, but you know, how can Instagram. people? Instagram it's is where I post where shows will be. It's rusty.dewees. Yeah, I put it in the description also. 
Thank you. I love pointing yeah. down like that in the description. <laughs> yeah, there, there you go. There you go. But yeah, yeah. we'll do it. Do, we'll do it again. Then, you know, do it in the winter. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that'd oh, be super maybe cool. we can do like show. You can show us around and some of that. That would be kind of cool. Your uh... show us around around the barn in the house. Oh yeah, yeah. that would be fun. Sure. Um, also, um, if you ever think of anybody that you think would be a good guest, let me know because <laughs> um, I yeah we just we're, we're really having fun with this you know and I, well, i'll I tell you who i'll tell you who'd be a good guest okay jay craven oh yeah that would be great <laughs> i would love he, that he, he's very approachable mm -hmm. jay craven uh kingdom county productions yep uh, i'll give you his uh e e facebook me there, all right Jay's. i'll give you his email i auditioned and for him and oh my god was that a scary time because he he um there were like a bunch of people and I swear to God, it was like so intimidating because he had this demeanor about him that was does, very, yeah. very, very like just calm yet stern. And I was just like, yeah. I, I was so bizarre because I don't really know him at all. But I, I remember that being like, I'd been in a lot of auditions and this was like probably the most nervous I'd ever been. <laughs> well, that movie we just shot, Nantucket, and um, it's about Ethan Allen. That comes out next June. Ah. So I'll give you his email thing. And at the least, you contact him. Say, I'm your friend of Rusty's. He was just on a podcast. And, and I'll hit him up. Say, Jay, this guy Jason's going to get in touch with you. And uh, if if nothing, if nothing, just say, hey, man, when your movie comes out, we'd like to have you on to promote the crap out of it. And, oh, yeah, he'll do it. He, he's fucking fascinating. Oh, shit, man. Oh, yeah, that's a, good, that's you, a good idea. I don't know why I didn't think of Jay Craven. That's a great idea. Wow. Sure. Yeah. Oh, please. Yeah, I will. I'll message you for sure. Oh, that's great. Wow. This is great. Um, sorry, I, we, I can talk forever, but, <laughs> but, but I, I understand you're, you have electronics things and <laughs> issues and, and Rena doesn't, Rena's probably tired. <laughs> usually do tap out at the two hour mark. Isn't All right. I'm tired. She's out there in LA. What time is it? Down here? Is it it's, it's almost seven out here. Oh, wow. Uh, no. All right. Well, God, thank you so much for doing this, Rusty. And yes, we will do this again for sure. Yeah. Without a pleasure. doubt. I'll yeah. have the guitar. I've written songs. A couple of funny ones and play them. Oh, yeah. that'd be really oh, fun. Oh, yeah. That'd be fun. Well, I could bring my stuff there and we could do a, we could do a duet. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> that'd be yeah. so fun. Oh, oh, my God. We talked about doing intermissions for this show. So maybe you guys could put together like a little intermission <laughs> jingle or something for us to play. Oh my God. Well, good luck with it. You know, good, good luck with the show, you know? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. yeah oh, I forgot to tell you, uh, you don't, you don't have to go when I say goodbye. I'm just, it's sort of ending the show. I'm, uh, so I have the, there's the cat. The, the... It's the, the cat shows up around the two hour mark. Yeah. He's like, it's time for you to stop this now. <laughs> Hey, Rena, <laughs> Rena, we didn't touch on this, but get on my Instagram and uh, go through my posts. I'm a cat lover. I have a cat named Michaela, and it's similar looking to yours. Oh, yeah. This is this is Oliver Dennis. Cute. And we think that he's part Maine Coon. Mm -hmm. he's, he's pretty big, he's, yeah. Yeah, he's only a year, and he's, like, starting to grow this mane. And I think, like, I got him from a rescue, and I think he might be... Uh, tabby mixed with the main coon super lovable. he is great he's sweet man yeah he's really sweet and, and mischievous he will knock things in the toilet because he likes to see the toilet flush so he, he'll get on the bathroom counter knock something in if you leave it open and then we'll look to see i'm like no we're not flushing everything down the toilet that's not, <laughs> that's not jason J jason you have pets you guys yeah we have a cat it's a white cat his name's salem that's great. <laughs> yeah. He's super I, love, I, like I, I love dogs. I love dogs. But with this life I have, I don't think I'd be able to treat it, you know, the dog the dog properly. Yeah, but I will same here. Yeah, I would love a giant dog, but I'm not I I'm, I'm not responsible enough. I have too many things going on. I would need to that becomes your life if you have a big dog. If you're a good owner anyway. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah. That's what I let my little Charlie is like, he's very like, he likes to go to happy hour. He likes to go to the store with you. Like, cause he just kind of like fits his life into like city living and every place in my neighborhood lets dogs in everywhere. 
So mm-hmm. they're wow. like, it's, it's almost like weird if there aren't dogs. Like when I travel, I'm like, oh, where are all the dogs in the T-Mobile store? Like, because <laughs> yeah, people just bring their dogs everywhere. So he just comes, you know, runs errands, goes to Target with me. <laughs> There's a music store here. I don't play any instruments. We have to stop at the music store because <laughs> Charlie likes to go in and get a treat because the guy at the music store loves dogs. So he keeps treats and then all the dogs come and visit him. And oh, so we go cool. to the music store. To- that's a great. I remember Jason, um, years and years ago, I was going to ask you if you're still playing years and years ago, the only time I saw you, and it was great. It was quite powerful was in Reraz. but this, oh, this yeah. has to be, this has to be a decade ago. Yeah. Yeah. But it was cool. You Thank were up you. there hitting it in that corner deal. Yeah. And it was, uh, it was powerful, man. That was one of our first shows. We stopped playing uh, Reraz because, um, well, they don't, they don't, they didn't at the time pay very well because you don't. It doesn't matter who you are there; they're going to be full on Saturday night, no matter what. Oh, so they didn't right. offer anything for drawing crowds, and we yeah. drew crowds. So we were just like, and it was such a bad place to load stuff in. And but I love Reraz, though. I mean, it's a great place to go. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, but that was a fun show. <laughs> oh, you were there? Oh, wow, that's weird. <laughs> and wow. I stayed. I stayed for a while. Yeah. Oh, well, that's fantastic. Yeah. Right. Well, awesome. How's yeah. your How's your phone doing? Is it going to die? So we should go. Or... No, I mean we can go till it dies. I mean I don't care. It said ten percent. I hate not having the resolution at the end, though. <laughs> you might also. No, but that's cool. Reach yeah. a point in which the cat knocks some of my equipment out. So. Isn't that? Isn't that part of the whole thing? And the, yeah. the interview just ends. Yep. Yeah. And well, it happened a couple of times. I was like, oh, and there he goes. He's gone. Wow. So what are your, what are your, do you have any more film projects coming up? Cause I also just want to know because I'm, I'm selfish. I want to know <laughs> if, no. there, if there's anything going on. <laughs> well, as you know, there's not much of a scene up here. You know, Jay was doing this and there's a part for me. Uh, I did a movie with the uh, Sheriff Brothers. Uh, God, it's with, it's great. It's with uh, David Warner. David Warner. He's an English actor. It's really good. Shot in Franconia. You can get that one on these streaming things. David Werner. He's an old English guy. Look that up. Uh, mm-hmm. I forget. A lot of people are in. Eric Roberts is in it. Chevy Chase is actually in it. Mm-hmm. I have a really good part in that. I play a, a nurse. His his nurse and. Uh, really cool but no i don't seek that stuff Mm. but every once in a while somebody will have a part soulmates these two girls from la who are from vermont did you see soulmate oh check out soulmates rena soulmates it's two women vermonters they wrote it they followed through they came here and they wrote the part of the storekeeper rusty i'm I'm in that and uh, play a little music in that and uh where can i see it you can that's on most of those streaming things okay soulmates and you'll see these two girls faces and it's like a real Vermont sort of puff piece. It's like a Hallmarky type thing. But yeah, they called me. So no, I don't seek those things out. Hmm. Yeah. Now, it's, um, fun to get, it's fun to do it every once in a while. Oh, yeah, definitely. Now, on Radical Jack, did you go to the Holiday Inn with all of us and Billy Ray Cyrus um, after one of the sets when he did karaoke? No. Oh. No. I, w- I can't wait. I want to talk to somebody about that that was there because he did Icky Breaky Heart. And and didn't tell people he was going to be going up there. <laughs> so That's all of a cool. sudden, there's Billy Ray Cyrus, and you're like, "What?" <laughs> in karaoke in Rutland, Vermont. Well, well, my Br- Billy, Billy Ray Cyrus story is is a uh, fits this. Um, I had just started the logger, and we were shooting night night in, in Rutland. <clears throat> and the camera, there was a camera set up, and Billy Ray was cool, as you know. And I looked over, Rena to the side two in the morning it's about five 55 to 60 year old rutland women surrounding billy ray and he was singing achy break your heart they said do achy break your heart but he wasn't just doing the chorus he was doing the whole song and i was just starting the logger and i didn't know the logger would have legs but i looked at that and i said that guy's sitting there and singing the whole song for these ladies so you have to give the folks all the time that they ever want, you know, and uh, I, I learned that. That was a lesson I learned from Billy Ray. Uh, yeah. He's a super nice guy. Yeah. <laughs> like just 
just beyond nice. <laughs> Who's such yeah, a did, great guy? After that, you did that movie with him. Didn't you always like like seeing it when he had a success? You know, you're, yeah, oh, I was always because really he because they had that thing where he was like kind of like uh, ostracized from society because of the song. And I'm like, I'm sorry, he's a great guy. And who was that guy? George. Um, he was he on that set too. George something. He played the he played Fred in Back to the Future, like crazy drunk drivers. That guy. He was in Radical mm -hmm. Jack. He played the main bad guy or secondary bad guy. He uh, said to me one day, he goes, that Billy Ray, he's a good guy. And I never met anybody from Tennessee that wasn't, or Kentucky, Kentucky, that wasn't a good guy. And I was just like, cool. and that always hit me like, yeah, he's just a really great guy. And maybe everybody in Kentucky's <laughs> wonderful. I don't know. <laughs> just a manly guy. But he, ha he has had a couple of hits since then. And I was always mm. happy to see you know, and then Miley doing well, and you know, it's yeah, great. yeah, definitely. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, I well, you know, we we both were in a lot of David Jean Cole movies, so I could sit and reminisce about them all day. Like I was in Peril and uh, Icebreaker. Um, I was in Icebreaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sean Astin, he's also a really good guy. Yeah. He for no reason at all, he invited me and my friend back to his trailer to meet his wife and baby. I didn't know I was hanging out with uh, Samwise Gamgee, but I did know I was hanging out with Rudy. And that was the movie that I, I we talked about the most. I was just like, Rudy was inspirational to me, you know? And I, I loved that movie. I mean, didn't I don't play famous, football, but... Didn't he have a famous mother? Wasn't his mother Patty Duke? I think he had a Patty famous Duke mother. Patty Duke asked, and you just, maybe before your yeah. time, but she was, she was huge. Yeah, I knew he had a famous mother, but I didn't know who she was. Yeah, Patty Duke. Yeah, yeah, that was cool. I I loved that David was doing that. We're we're actually David said he was going to do an interview. Um, it just hasn't yeah. we haven't connected again. He said, oh. "Yeah, I'd love to," and then the connection hasn't been. <laughs> so if you talk to him, remind him, check yeah, his no, email. <laughs> I've, been, I've been talking to him for a while. Yeah, just a oh, just a uh, just a great guy. And the thing about the key thing with that those things, Jason, is he had again. His father was a huge, big, big time businessman in Relum. And he had a distribution deal. Oh, yeah. He had those movies paid for before he would shoot. Peter Beckwith was his part yeah. before he would shoot them. So, you know, poor Jay's got to go scrounging around and guys like you. So he, he just, and I recognized that. And I was like, well, I can, I can, you know, work on my chops with this guy. And plus he paid. Yeah, he was a really good businessman. Like he he would he yeah. would get the distributing done before he even finished the movie. He would just say, "This is who's going to be in it. This is what's going on." And then it would it just was a great he was great at business. It was really what he was just really smart. Yeah. And it's good to it's good to be that. <laughs> oh. Business. Yeah, I'm yeah, I'm not good at that part. <laughs> not at all. I give everything away well, for free. It's not really <laughs> It doesn't run, I don't know about you, Rena, but it doesn't seem to run fluid in the uh, veins of artists. Mm. I am mm. fortunate because I, I have a, a little of both and both are attractive to me. Mm. The creative, the performance, and seeing those cars pull into the lot when I was doing those plays at Vermont Repertory Theater. Again, we did all that work. I'd stand out back and watch the cars pull into the lot. So that's a very interesting, it's as important to me, the business part is as fun to me as the creative part. So I'm fortunate that way. Yeah, that is really important because you're right. A lot of creatives are like, I don't want anything to do with that. And, you know, and I think self-promotion is like, it's, it's so necessary, but it's really hard for a lot of creatives. Uh, but it's, yeah, you, you have to do it because that's how you, because you also have to make a living, right? Like you got to pay the bills too. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> that's the yeah. biggest, that's a big obstacle. <laughs> yeah, how do you, sure. how do you do the camera back and forth? When Rena talks, it goes to her. That's good. Oh, you, um, you have it set on yours to, um, to show whoever's talking. So oh. if I stop talking and she starts talking, you have it set like that. Like I have it set right now. So it's a three, three people on the screen, but I could change it to that. It's up at the top right hand corner. It says view. Well, actually okay. you're on the phone, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, it's different there. I don't know how to do it on the phone, but yeah. I thought, I thought one of you guys was doing that. I'm like, God damn good camera work. No, but when I, you know, it's funny you say that because um, I do edit it later and I do, T 
take the squares and then I, I cut back and forth because zoom isn't always perfect. Cause like, if you're talking and I go <clears throat> like that, it'll cut to me for a second and then cut back to you. And that drives oh. me nuts. <laughs> so, so yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I need more control <laughs> as a, as an editor, I, I have to have control over the pictures. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's yeah. the, hey, the editing, that's where the story, that's where the story's told, man. Oh, yeah, yeah, the for editing. sure. Fucking A. Yeah, there's three movies, a script, and then there's the shooting of it, and then it's the editing. And they're all different. <laughs> yeah. So true. Wow, again, yeah. That's why, that's why the smoking, because um, cause I liked, I used to watch Johnny Carson growing up, and all those guys would smoke, you know, and that was just so rom romantic to me. You know? Yeah, that's why I used to smoke, actually. It was like a James Dean thing, and I didn't even watch James Dean. I was just like, I don't know, like or Bruce Willis Die Hard or something. You, And it's funny because, like, now, um, like, I have a 17-year-old, and she thinks, you know, smoking is just totally the opposite of cool, you know? Um, right, right. And they, it's kind of the way it is now in film. Like, if you don't, you know, they don't really romanticize it as much as they used to. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I mean it's so so weird. i used to think it was super cool and i do actually still think it's cool i just choose not to smoke right <laughs> it looks well, awesome <laughs> i mean in the 60s it was ubiquitous you know yeah yeah, yeah. to think to think that marina to think that people smoke on airplanes is the fucking bizarre hospitals <laughs> yeah, yeah that yeah. i cannot imagine i it must have been just one cloud of smoke and like you can't have a smoking and non-smoking section in an airplane you're all in the same tube so oh yeah people that didn't smoke must have been just miserable there were ashtrays on the armrests yeah or at the in end of a plane yep or at the end of the aisles in grocery stores <laughs> oh in yeah. grocery stores yeah yeah there's an ashtray at the end of the aisles so you could why do you need to smoke while grocery shop like that just you're seems addicted to nicotine like, <laughs> yeah. like you can't wait till you go outside that's that no, it wasn't a, it wasn't a thought that wasn't yeah. a thing. It was just wow. a cigarette the light up going in you know oh yeah. The yeah yeah well that's a big thing though with time i mean my dad we we the way we heated our house was a kerosene heater you know what we did with you know how we did that we put it in the middle of the living room with no <laughs> ventilation and we'd go oh. chunk and this little black smoke would go up and hit the hit the ceiling and go Poof. But imagine, nobody thought about it <laughs> imagine that yeah yeah we're, we're much more healthy and yeah. i smoke about i smoke about four a week you know i don't think I, my doctor says don't worry about it but anyway it's not helping me but you know i don't think i'm worried about it. four cigars a week isn't a big deal your body can handle you that. don't inhale you know yeah yeah well it's four a week please that's nothing <laughs> that's not a problem at all no yeah but i mean i know people that smoke two packs a day that's a big deal <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's pretty intense <laughs> well so now i go over Rena to the house and i see little michaela and i feed her the, her nighttime food and i go to bed she gets right up on that bed man <laughs> cat hers yeah. <laughs> that's awesome yeah um our cat isn't allowed to do that <laughs> salem yeah yeah not named after the city named after the book salem's lot which okay. doesn't matter but i have to say that for some reason i wow. was thinking of salem the cat from sabrina the teenage witch oh no i didn't watch that Except he's a black he's a black cat well yeah not a white cat that's the joke i guess the white cat but, you know. my cat is named after the the female skier michaela schifrin oh okay world cup skier she's great yeah. wow well, yeah, we definitely have to have you back um, in, yeah, man. For, in the winter for sure. Yeah, that'll, definitely do it. So we'll fun. have a good time. Thanks for having me. Oh, God, it was a blast. I'm so happy to talk to you. Um, uh, yeah, it was great to meet you. Yeah. Nice to meet Thanks for doing it. My yeah. Pleasure. What are you doing for the rest of the night? Yeah, I'll, I'll dick around here a little bit, to try to get my thing charging and check my stuff. And Yeah, go over and turn in one thing i do is I, I i get good rest i'm able to get good mm. rest you know i'm always eight at least eight a night and nine and uh, must be nice 
Or a key, yeah, right. I don't have a family, so. Well, he showed me a picture. He's like, <laughs> he I just said, I don't have a family, so I get good rest. <laughs> well, it's true. He showed me this. He's like, I just went for my evening walk. Here's my view, and he showed me a picture. Was that Mount Mansfield, or what was that? Yes, it was. Yeah, yeah, and I'm like, great. And I took a picture of Luke eating dinner. I'm like, here's my view. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll look at that. I, I was concerned about. Uh, again, I'll tell you, you don't know how lucky, because it was it was sending me through. I had to get on the app and then it was sending me through passwords and a new pa and it, it just and then the code thing i thought it was getting warm and i asked you it was like two of and i asked you what the code and the code came and then they said give me this other code and you gave it and then boom luck is just very lucky nice <laughs> well, all right this has all been right. awesome um Thanks yeah a lot. yeah take care man have a wonderful evening talk to you soon i will yeah see all you right. nice to meet you Rena. Yeah, and thanks for watching, everybody. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons. And share. Yes. And comment. Say, tell us some stuff. Commenting's awesome. I, I, I'm the. I think I'm. I think I'm the only one that reads them. But I, I'm always. I'm always responding to people. <laughs> I don't know That's why. Good. But cool. That's good. Keep, keep keep it up. Yeah. All right. Have a good night. See ya. All right.